control Shoveling dirt in every hole Predators to condemn your soul Watching you and watching me We're all connected but separated Misunderstood and so frustrated A million armies of one have invaded Watching you and watching me We live behind glass curtains And act like nothing's wrong Soon you will be To make headlines be immortalized Everyone's got an electric eye with the digital spies Little brother Standing by to dethrone each other Watching you and watching me Paranoid, the lens is our weapon Desensitized in our lust for attention Democratized by our boyer obsessions Watching you and watching me Slips to perfection Don't let them project you as you are
let your experience begin right now. From high atop the mountains of British Columbia to you listening around the world, this is Spaced Out Radio. You can follow us on our website, spacedoutradio.com, on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. You can follow us on Instagram, Dave Scott, S-O-R, or on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. Buckle up, space travelers. It's time to go for a ride as we are live on Spaced Out Radio. Tonight, I am your host, Dave Scott. Good to have you with us at spacedoutradio.com, on Spreaker, and on Revolution Radio as we come into tonight's show and broadcast live on Uncle Jimbo's Cabin in the Great White North on this Tuesday night, early Wednesday morning, if you're on the East Coast. Here at Spaced Out Radio, we do this thing three hours a night, seven days a week. We want to be your official one-stop shop when it comes to the paranormal, supernatural, spiritual, demonic, and so much more. If you're on the Spaced Out Radio side and you like our music, you can click on spacedoutradio.com and the Ron Bumblefoot Thal banner. The guitar god himself, Bumblefoot, formerly of Guns N' Roses, is the official music of Spaced Out Radio. You can also check us out on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. On Instagram, I can be followed at Dave Scott SOR. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. And our website is spacedoutradio.com. Right now, I'd like to say hello to... Everyone listening in on the Revolution Radio chat room on the High Plains Talk Radio Network in the Space Out Radio chat room on Spreaker, along with our fans on Facebook at Euphoria Chronicles, Chronicles of the Unknown, Forest Moon Paranormal, and our flagship chat room, the SOR Space Travelers. Have you signed up for the SOR Space Travelers Club yet? No? Well, it's time. It's only five bucks a month, and with that, your name gets entered in a monthly prize draws. You get access to a private group interviews, access to a special section on our website, and much more. Hey, we're going to give you a hell of a lot more than just access to our archives. While at Spaced Out Radio, you can also check out our latest blogs. Mine is how it ties in this show with anxiety and depression, because I suffer from that, and it all seems to come together. You can also check out Eric Markham's SOR Spacewire for your latest in weird news. Tonight's show is brought to you by Rivulet Reiki and Readings, providing healings in person or to distance. Purpleplates.com, helping heal your body, mind, and soul. The new Agora newspaper is the official paper of this show. And the iTunes app, Spirit Story Box, it's the official ghost hunting app of SOR. Remember, if you are a listener on Revolution Radio, the Double R Machine is the largest non-profit radio station online. Do us a favor, take the time to visit freedomslips.com and donate today. Andrea Message is what I would describe, and this is my opinion personally, as an unwilling participant of the paranormal. She was skeptical and pretty much a non-believer in ghost schools, spirits, or anything odd or strange. She really didn't have time for this type of imaginary folklore. It wasn't into her study it, make that, it wasn't in her to study it, read up on it, or even tolerate an in-depth conversation on anything out of the ordinary. But it's amazing how one's attitude and philosophy can change, and quickly, 
when a personal unexplained experience just comes from right out of the blue. Since that experience, Andrea has jumped in with both feet into the deep end of the paranormal pool. From ghost hunting to chasing down demons, she's seen the good, the bad, and the ugly that the paranormal has to offer. And this is an important topic to discuss. Because Andrea is one of those investigators who now goes in and cleans up the paranormal messes left by other groups whose lack of experience may have caused more harm than good. Andrea Message joins us on Spaced Out Radio tonight. Andrea, welcome back to the show. How have you been? I have been doing fantastic, and thank you so much for having me back. I'm really excited to be here. I'm excited to have you, too, because lately you haven't had very many good experiences with radio show hosts. So I got, no, I, I haven't. you know what? I, I got to change that. I'm going to change that tonight. You know, I'm ending that bad radio karma <laughs> for you and we're going to have some fun and we're going to get into a lot of questions. Our audience is going to participate because our chat rooms are already packed Ooh, and they're listening fun. in and they will be asking you questions. Okay. So when they fire up, I will, read off the questions and they're usually pretty smart they keep me on my toes so it's going to be a fun night indeed and once again i am glad to have you back a lot of our new listeners you know because the last time we actually had you on we were still this small little dainty little radio show and now and now we've grown quite a bit and our confidence has grown and i mean you've seen us around and you've been a supporter of this show as well in listening i love it And thank you for that. So a lot has changed. A lot of our listeners are brand new and we're gaining new listeners on a daily basis. So I would love it because your story is intriguing. You didn't believe in any of this. You were, you were somebody who was like, get that crap away from me. I don't really need to, to, (laughs) to be hearing, you know, these, these folklore stories of ghosts and goblins. What changed your mind? What happened to you? Well, basically, like you said, I was completely skeptical. I mean, I was one of those, my brother, um, Andy, and his now wife, Jamie, at the time, girlfriend, were very big into the paranormal. And I was one of those who would laugh at them whenever they'd come and try to tell me a ghost story to say, come on this tour with me, or let's go see this haunted place. And I just, you know, it was just like, to me, it was silly, because I I kept thinking, well, what would a ghost want to stay in this world anyway for? You know, I mean... It just seems like this would not be a place that I would want to stay because there's so much wrong with the world. And, you know, and and I was one of those, you know, I was growing up teenager. I was the typical like moody, everything sucked kind of a a teenager. So I did. I just didn't believe that it could be possible. But one day my brother and his now wife went to Gettysburg and they're not the souvenir collectors where they'll go into a souvenir shop and, you know, buy like a little bell or something that says like Gettysburg on it. They want to take something that has meaning to them. And one of the things that my brother did collect was little pebbles from the battleground at Gettysburg because he was like, wow, you know, people walked here, people fought here, people died here. This is, you know, something really powerful. So he brought these little pebbles home. At the time, they weren't married and he was still living with, um, you know, me and my mom and dad. And so he had that. And all of a sudden, after he came home, things started to happen. And they were things that I could ignore at first. But uh, their friends went to this thing called Bastille Days in Milwaukee. Um, they were about 35, 40 minutes away from home. And I heard somebody come into the house, walk through my kitchen, walk past my stairs that led up to my bedroom loft and into my brother's room. And I assumed my brother had come home from Bastille days. So I went downstairs to talk to him. And sure enough, his bedroom light was on and I had turned it off myself because my mom was one of those like, she goes crazy if you leave unattended lights on that aren't necessary to raise her bill. So she made me turn off all the lights before I went to bed. So I went to go and speak to my brother and his door opened by itself. And when I looked in, there was nobody in the room. And I thought, okay, this is kind of weird. So I went to my mom's and I said, you know, I went to her bedroom and I kind of asked her, did anybody come home and say goodnight to you and leave? And she's like, no, but I heard somebody come home, you know, is, are they in their bedroom? I said, no, I think we got a problem. Somebody might've broken into the house. 
because we both heard the walking. We both heard, you know, somebody going into the bedroom. The light was on when it shouldn't have been on. So, of course, I grab a butcher knife and I get my mom a butcher knife and we're putting knife in the basement door just in case anybody snuck down there so they couldn't get back upstairs. And I'm walking around the house like Dirty Harry, you know, trying to be all brave and checking under beds and checking in closets. And I went and looked in my brother's room one more time and I turned the light. And as I left, the light turned back on by itself. So I went and I turned it off one more time and I start backing out of the room slowly watching the light switch. And sure enough, the light switch goes up by itself. And after a frantic call to my brothers, they come rushing home and they're checking everything. All the doors are locked. The windows were locked. There was no footprints in the mud except their own because it had just been raining. And so they could see their footprints, but there was nobody else there. And so there was nothing that really could be explained at that time. And my mother and I both heard it. It wasn't just something that I heard and thought, okay, I can pass it off. My mother heard the exact same thing in the exact same manner, the same kind of heavy boots, the same walking the, in, right into where my uh, brother would be sleeping. And it, it was just undeniable at that time. But I, I'm like, Meh. okay, we, we can explain this away. Mass hysteria. It's got to be something. And then after that, things started to happen where I'd hear people saying my name when there was nobody actually in the house at the time except for myself. And there was a case when I was looking for batteries for remote control. And all of a sudden, 20 minutes after I was sitting on my bed and talking to a friend on the phone when I hadn't found the batteries, a box comes flying from the very back of my closet on the top shelf. I mean, it was pushed way back there. And it literally flew eight feet to where my bed was. And the only reason it stopped was because uh, it hit my bed and that ended its momentum. And when the box spilled out, there was all these batteries in the box, all the batteries that I had bought and lost. And I had forgotten that I put them up there. Um, so we had a lot of different things that were happening in the house that I couldn't explain. I mean, you can't explain a, blo a box flying eight feet. I mean, yeah, it could tip out and fall into the closet, but how does it fly eight feet? But then, unfortunately, my father got very sick, and he was he had terminal cancer. It was 15 years that he had it, and you know we knew it was eventually going to happen. And unfortunately, he went into the hospital and never came out that last time. And so at that time, nothing was really going on because there was just this whole thing about my dad and preparing for the funeral. And my grandmother had just died a few months before my dad. And so it was a really tough time for us. And things really kind of settled down. Or maybe I just didn't notice it. But um, a month after my father had passed away, my mom and I had just bought a brand new landline phone. We were having problems with those uh, those recorders that had the little tapes in them. They weren't the yes. digital kind yet. And it, we just had so many problems with it that we decided to get rid of it and get into the digital era. And a month after my dad died, the very first message we got on this brand new landline was all this white noise. And then in the middle of the white noise was my dad's voice saying, I love you. And then another voice that we couldn't identify saying, there's the light, let's, and then it cut out. And after that, oh there was goodness. no more activity in the house whatsoever. Um, and so I kind of surmised, I mean, obviously, I don't know for sure, but I think that whatever came into the house must have come from Gettysburg with my brother, maybe attached to him or his, you know, now wife, and stayed because he knew that my dad was not long for the world. And maybe he knew that my dad was very spiritual, very religious, and would be able to help him pass. When my dad passed, they'd be able to go together because obviously he'd been stuck since, you know, Gettysburg, you know, the Battle of Gettysburg. So, you know, perhaps he didn't know how to go, but he knew my dad would. And so he stayed with us waiting for my dad to help him cross over. You know, it's, that's kind of what I thought, at least. I'm not going to lie. I still have goosebumps all over my arms from that story. Yeah. And, it, and it reminded me of when Mrs. Spaced Out Radio's grandfather passed away. They they were very close when she was young, but they, yeah. they dr drifted apart as as he started an, a, a new life with a new woman and all this kind of stuff. And within a day or two of his passing, my wife got the phone call as well with the white noise and then... Uh, the voice in behind where she just knew it was her grandfather on the other end. And the funny part about it is we had a private phone line that nobody had the phone number to. Like we didn't even get, you know, telemarketers on that phone. It was strict. It <laughs> yeah. was, str it was strictly for our house alarm. And then that phone call comes in. 
and it's weird how they can seem to tap into a phone line like that, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And, you know, and it wasn't just that. That same night, my brother, Andy, the one who I assume brought the ghost home from Gettysburg, he called and he he just had he was like in a panic because um, at this time he had been he had just gotten married and he was now living with his wife in their first apartment. And he just rushed to our house after calling us saying, just stay home. I got to talk to you. And he was all white when he got there. And he said that I was just, you know, on my computer and AOL Instant Messenger pops up and he goes, I don't have AOL Instant Messenger. I don't use instant messages. But it was, you know, my dad's name, which is also my oldest brother's name. So at first he thought it was my oldest brother. And it said, the lightning is beautiful up here. And my brother couldn't figure out what that meant because it was a beautiful night. There were no clouds in the sky. It was starry. And so we called my brother to ask him what he was talking about. And my other brother was confused because he was in a squad car. He's a, or he's um, retired now, uh, injured on duty, but he was a police officer. And he was in the middle of you know a stop. And so he was in a squad car writing a ticket. He's like, I'm not messing with AOL Instant Messenger. I'm, I'm at, you know, at work. I'm on duty. So my brother went to see if he could take a picture of this little thing that said my dad's name and then the lightning is beautiful up here, but it was gone. So, and that was the last, um, that happened that same day. Like ours happened earlier in the afternoon. That one happened towards evening. And then that was pretty much the end of it. But yeah, it's, it is weird how they can tap into different frequencies in order to try to communicate with us. It, it is amazing when spirit has the, that will and that power. Have you ever heard of, uh, she goes by Dr. Love, uh, what is her name here? I had her on the air one time. She wrote a book about that called uh, called Love Never Dies, and yeah. I know her name will come to me momentarily, but I'm just saying this off the top of my head. And we were doing actually a recording for this show, and doing the interview, and so we're doing it over Skype, just like this phone call is. Yeah. And I paused to take a break. And her and I were chatting during the break so we could, you know, catch our breath and grab a glass of water, bathroom break, whatever it was. And I come back, I'm sitting down, and I got my headphones on, and I'm, and she goes, well, just one second. And in the background, I hear the white noise all of a sudden pick up and the voice of her husband, Jean. And, oh. and I said, I said, doctor, did you hear that? And she goes, hear what? And I said, well, there was just this white noise, this static coming through the line and then i heard a man's voice kind of mumbling i couldn't make out what it says she starts laughing she goes yeah that happens to me every time she goes remember at the beginning of this conversation i told you he will probably come into this phone call there he is <laughs> yeah you know yeah. yeah and you know and like i said there's a whole bunch of different theories as to why it is but one of the theories that i really do play a lot with is the fact that the spirits are on a different frequency than we're on. And you know how kids seem to be more perceptive of the paranormal than yes. grown-ups? And there's a lot of reasons for that as well. But one reason is if you take a test on YouTube, there's a lot of these audiology tests where you can try and hear the frequencies that you can no longer hear. What I could hear as five years, you know, as a five-year-old kid, I can't hear anymore. That frequency is gone to me. I can only hear starting maybe, well, I'm not going to give away my real age. I'm old enough. I, But, you know, it, it starts like maybe about five years before my real age and it slowly gets louder until my real age. And then from my age until about 100, I can hear perfectly fine. So there are frequencies that we do lose every year that we age, we start to lose those frequencies. And sometimes the reason why we can't hear them necessarily on, you know, right in front of us, like unless it's on a recorder or maybe like the Skype or a telephone is because those are frequencies that we can no longer hear with the naked ear. And it takes like, for example, an audio recorder, like a digital recorder, records on various frequencies, frequencies that we can't hear, and it pulls it up into a universal frequency that when we put on our headphones and we upload it to the computer, it should be something that the average person can now hear. It's still faint, but it's now in kind of a frequency that we're able to distinguish. And I think that's why they do use a lot of the equipment like telephones or recorders because it's easier for them to communicate on the frequency that they're able to communicate without expressing so much energy. I mean, that's a theory. That's just one of my theories. But um, that's kind of kind of the idea that I've been getting over the years that I've been working on this. I was never really sure about the whole child thing until my daughter 
and I swear at the age of 18 months, she started seeing paranormal. She's yeah. now she's now 17. She's turned it off, you know, because society and and school and friends and peer well, pressure exactly, yeah. kind of kind of switches it off, and she kind of fights with it now. But from the age of about one and a half to three, man, was she active. She yeah. was so active, whether it was spirits in her room and and seeing spirits. It's amazing how that open mind of a child, because they're so, so not formed by the edu- educational system or anything yep. like that, it's still so pure that if you allow them and say, well, you know, it's not an imaginary friend or, you know, that conversation that most parents have, yours probably had exactly, it, mine yeah, had it. Yeah. You know, it's amazing what you can get out of a child. Yep. Well, and I I wrote a book, Ghost in the Coal Cellar, and in the book, one of the chapters actually deals with a child that was having communications with the spirit. And during the time when um, this child was having the communications, she was maybe not quite three years old at the time, just kind of like at the three years old, and then it kind of progressed as she aged to four years old. And the parents were very worried and took her to her pedi- or pediatrician. Yeah, pediatrician. I don't have kids, so I don't know what their doctors are. But they, she took them to the pediatrician. The pediatrician said, well, you know, this is developmentally, she's normal. Why don't you see a child psychologist? And the child psychologist said, well, you know, maybe she's just ahead of the grade. Because usually imaginations for a child develops around the age of four and a half to five years old. Obviously, she's, you know, developing this imaginary friend really early on. But they were going off the fact that, oh, your child's just advanced. They weren't taking into consideration that this wasn't an imaginary friend. So when you have a child that's under a certain age that's having communications or seems to be looking at something or seems to be interacting with something that's not there, and they are before the threshold of imaginary friends, which is usually four and a half, five years old, then sometimes you really do got to question, is it really something that they're just make-believing or is it something that they're actually seeing? Based on child psychology, everything that I've read and every child psychologist I've ever spoken to do say that imaginations like imaginary friends and making up those kind of games usually don't start until a certain age because they're still working on their motor skills while they're in the toddler age. So when you see a toddler that has an imaginary friend, it really does kind of make you wonder and it makes you question. And it really is kind of worth asking them questions like, what does your friend look like? What's your friend's name? If they can try to express it to you in the way that, you know, at their age, they can express it without being too leading. Obviously, you don't want to say, are you seeing a ghost? Are you seeing, you know, dead people? You just kind of want to have a conversation with them and see what kind of information they can give you. And you know what? That's a good lesson for parents too. If I if I do say that, because a lot of parents we're not sure how to react. We're supposed yeah. to have those answers for children. We're supposed to be able to, Andrea, explain if a child says, you know, I'm playing with my imaginary friend. We're supposed to say, well, our child has such a nice imagination, or something like that. Yeah. We're supposed to be logical, and we're supposed to raise our children logically, and open yeah. things up like this. It opens up a whole different world. And I'll I'll give you an example about this. I made the parental mistake. My daughter, unfortunately, inherited my depression and anxiety. It runs on my side of the family. And one day I was having a phone conversation with her counselor. And I don't know why I asked her counselor this, because I don't really talk about it. I said, has my daughter ever discussed with you that she sees dead people? Mm -hmm. And the counselor was like, oh that's not good we should probably look at getting her on some medication for that now yeah, yeah and yeah. i and i immediately said um no you will not do that it runs in the family and this is a gift that she's been given she's not crazy i exactly, said yeah. I, I said maybe as a counselor you should be opening up your mind a little bit to see that there is another reality out there instead of prescribing medication yeah Right, because yeah, and that's me. the bad thing is they're always it's always medication. That's the first answer. If they're hyperactive or if they seem to have concentration issues, it's let's medicate them. You know, and absolutely, and it's so wrong because it yeah. shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be that way at all. 
You know, this has to be an open conversation. It has to be open dialogue, whether exactly. it's children or whether it's people who are finding the paranormal like you did a little bit you know, later on in life, not much more, but a little bit later on in life where it shouldn't be a scary experience that people are having these things happen to them. Exactly. So when you have someone who is new to this, like you are, is just like thrown right into the deep end of the pool, like I said in the introduction about you, how do you break it down for them, Andrea? Well, it's, you know, it depends on the person themselves. Um, I've dealt with a lot of people who they want to have a paranormal experience and they kind of like look at this as entertainment. And then you have the people that are very scared and they're terrified and they just want this to go away. And then you have people who have a curious mind, like, okay, this happened. This is kind of strange. I don't want to be scared, but at the same time, I'm really curious. So it has to be on a case to case basis. It just depends on their personality. If they're people that are kind of obsessive about it, where they seem to be like wanting to put themselves in those situations where there are hauntings and so that they can have those experiences. I tell them about the dangers of being a paranormal investigator. It's not all fun and giggles and sitting around telling fart jokes. And, you know, there are things that can, I've been scratched. I've been pushed. I have had where it felt like something had its hand around my throat and I actually had trouble breathing. Um, I have actually seen somebody who had three fingers broken on an investigation, like actually broken during a demonic investigation, in fact. Um, so I tried to tell him, you know, these, this thing is not something we don't know. The paranormal is the unknown still. I mean, if it was scientific, it would be called science. It's called paranormal because it's still something that we cannot define and we cannot truly fully understand so why are you messing with it for fun? You just don't mess with it for a good time. You know, and I try to guide them in that way to show them the responsible way to look at the paranormal if they're truly interested. If it's somebody who's terrified, I will always tell them about my experiences and I will talk to them about the different types of hauntings from the inhuman to the uh, poltergeist, the... Um, residual and of course the intelligent which would be the human spirits and i explain them very you know simple I, I don't try to take it too far up i try to s explain it on as simple of a level as i can explain it and i tell them about the different recourses that they actually have and, and i try to make them feel empowered because the more they know and the more they understand the less afraid they are and so i try to kind of empower them and for those that have a good sense of curiosity a certain level of skepticism but but yet they still kind of want to understand, I sometimes will take them under my wing and I first educate them again on the different types of hauntings and the different way we do investigations. And I might actually take them on an investigation and show them how an investigation is done to kind of help stimulate their mind and hopefully maybe even convince them to work in the field if I really feel that they have promise in the field and that they could do a lot of good for not only learning about the paranormal, but helping people. Because helping people, helping spirits, and learning about the paranormal is the ultimate goal of somebody in paranormal research, not to just go and have a good time, you know, and at somebody else's expense. You got somebody that just wants to have fun because they had an experience that scared them and they want that scare again. They go into somebody's house, stir up all this activity, and then leave the people that live there with the aftermath. And um, so it just depends on the type of person, and that kind of leads me to how I'm going to handle them and hopefully guide them into, you know, understanding their experiences and where to go with what happened to them. You said something that is the ire of my anger right now. And it is the word science and scientific in the paranormal community. It is yeah. something that absolutely gets my hackles up. And I'll tell you why. Very, very few people, I would say out of 100 people, 99.8 of them are not, have nothing to do with science. Yeah. And for people out there in the paranormal field who are out playing with ghosts on a weekly weekend basis who are not doing anything but going to these travel lodges for ghosts or touristy type places to do their so-called investigations, 
you are not a scientist. Yeah. You are a weekend paranormal warrior. That's what you are. So what do you feel, Andrea? And I want to get into this for the next few minutes here. What do you sure. feel is right or wrong with the use of the term science when it comes to the paranormal? Well, again, when it comes to the use of science and the paranormal, for one thing, I can understand if you go in, for example, when I say that I go in with kind of a scientific mind frame, what I'm talking about is I go in to perform experiments. I have a hypothesis that, you know, which all scientists are with, they have a hypothesis, and then you go in and you perform experiments and you try to see what kind of experiments work, what kind of experiments don't. But the actual term science and paranormal kind of contradict each other because paranormal means that which is not defined under scientific terms. It would be great if we could one day eventually get to that point. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, I think it, it's going to be nearly... I don't want to say impossible because I don't believe in impossibilities, but it's hard because I believe that spirits are just like people or even when you're talking about inhuman spirits, they have their own personalities, they have their own wants and desires when it comes to interacting, they have their own moods, they could have mood swings. I mean, you could have a spirit that's on, you know, maybe PMSing and just doesn't want to be bothered. And so it's really hard to perform an experiment and actually have the kind of outcome that you're looking for every time, which is something that leads into science is when you can repeat an experiment and say, now I can prove this. And that's nearly impossible right now when you're talking about spirits. It doesn't mean that it'll never happen. It's just right now it's very hard. But a lot of times when you have people that go in and they claim to be scientists and they are going in and it just seems to me like they're trying to replicate what they see on television. They're not really actually going in to scientifically discover some kind of a new phenomenon and try to put, you know, a term to it, they're going in and they're trying to be Zach Bagans, or they're trying to be um, Grant Wilson and Jason Hawes, and, and then using science as an excuse for what they do. Um, and, and I think it's being thrown out there rather loosely. Because uh, a lot of people that go in, I mean, I would say right now, the paranormal field is just inundated with people that are there because they want to get on television. They're there because they want to try to find some sort of fame. I mean, there's a lot of people that I know, even the ones who've been on TV. I know a lot of people who've been on TV that try to get on TV to truly educate people, to truly tell them the truth about the paranormal. And, you know, they're leaving the field because they say that's not what people want anymore. People want capture a ghost in a box. They want, you know, people getting possessed every episode. You know, they want people to act like the Ghostbusters with all these scientific gadgets and go in there and get a haunting every single time. And, you know, so when it comes to science and the paranormal, especially the way the field is rolling right now, it's not something that can be an interchangeable word. It's you're either a scientist and you're performing experiments or you're a paranormal investigator and you're investigating a case of the paranormal. And it's really hard to interchange the two. You know, I I like to say that I go in with a mindset of a scientist because I want to perform experiments and I want to see what kind of experiments work, what kind of experiments don't. But at the same time, nothing that I'm going to come away with is going to be scientific proof of the paranormal right now. Um, hopefully in the future, maybe I'll be the one to make the billions of dollars, you know, coming up with the actual answer if I continue to do this and I continue to push the field forward and I continue to push the boundaries of what we do in the paranormal field. But right now, I'm not a scientist because I don't have any scientific evidence that I've actually come away with when it comes to the paranormal. So, I mean, I think, like I said, science is kind of thrown out there a little loosely, you know, but, um, you know, I, I don't know. It's it's a hard, because I like to say that I do it from a scientific mind frame, but not that I'm a scientist. You know, I'm not smart yes. enough to be a scientist, you know. No, and, and you know what? My, yeah. my SOR Spacewire News Director, Eric Markham, actually is a scientist. And him and I have ranted about this for at least two, three weeks now in regards yeah. to it. And this topic just keeps coming up because it's funny because when I get people asking me, hey, do you have any openings on Spaced Out Radio? We'd love to come on and get our paranormal team on. We've got some interesting stories. I'm always glad to hear. But I always ask the simple questions. What do you do with your evidence? Well, we collect yeah. it. Okay, you collect it. What do you do with it after you collect it? Well, we go through it and we, and then we 
archive it. Well, what do you do with your archives? It's amazing how many don't have an answer to that question. Then you say, well, why are you doing this? Well, we're trying to take a scientific approach. Well, you can't. You're not a scientist. You, you're not writing out a theory, you're not writing out a possibility, you're not writing out a conclusion. Because then when you ask them, what, it, what, is, what, is, what are you basing your conclusions on? They have no idea. Exactly. They have, yeah. they have no idea. Because in my opinion, and maybe I'm too stubborn about this, Andrea. <laughs> okay? Maybe I'm way too stubborn. But if you're sitting there going out every weekend playing with ghosts, it should be one of two things. It should be either A, you are trying to solve the trillion dollar question to life, and that is, is there life after death? Or B, you're trying to help someone, either the spirit or the party who is affected, to try and get rid of that spirit and send them to the light. To me, there's there's no other options Okay, yes, we can tell the stories, okay? We have a group here yeah. called Chronicles of the Unknown. They come on and do a paranormal show the third Monday of every month, okay? And they're actually telling British Columbia history as they film a television pilot. They're actually telling British Columbia history through the stories of the spirits they contact at all of these like haunted museums and everything like that, okay? They're doing something to help. If the spirit yeah. says, I want to go, they send it on its way. But 95, 98% of these groups have no idea what a conclusion should be. So in your opinion, as someone who seems to be on the same dialogue as me, what should be the conclusion of a paranormal investigation? Well, again, to see, that is where it gets difficult is because when you've been doing it as long as I have, and you you kind of have your a mind frame, and you've kind of figured out your vocation and your focus in life, because I went from trying to find answers to the paranormal to realizing that there are real people that need help, and my main goal now is to help people, especially when they're talking about malicious um, entities or when they're in a lot of fear. But like I said, you ever since, and don't get me wrong, I love paranormal shows. I, you know, I mean, it, it's a great, to me, it was really awesome when Ghost Hunters came out because my experience happened before Ghost Hunters. So I didn't even know that there were paranormal investigators out there that could help me. I was baptized by fire and I was on my own. I didn't know that I had help out there. I didn't know that there was something where people could have come in to explain what happened to me. I had to learn it all by myself. So when Ghost Hunters came out, it was fantastic. It was like, oh my God, there are these people out there. And, you know, and then all of a sudden people who were afraid to come forward and tell their stories or afraid to come forward and seek help because they thought that they were going to be humiliated or ostracized by their communities. They finally came to us and started seeking the help that they really need. But then as we started to go on and the networks wanted to push the envelope and they said, well, it's no longer good enough that you're here doing research and that you're helping people. We want something like spectacular. We want to see possessions. We want to see catch a spirit, you know, in a mirror and then release it out into the wild, you know, like, you know, like a wildlife rescue, only a ghost kind of a thing. And now you have people that are watching that. And they say, they claim, oh, we're doing it for science and we're doing it to help people. But really what they're doing it is trying to emulate what they see on TV and hope in hopes, you know, that they'll catch their big break when it comes to getting on TV. Because I've noticed, like, you know, we'll talk a lot about the equipment we use or the places that we visit or the different types of hauntings. I'm very open about it. If people have questions, you ask me questions and I answer to the best of my ability. Again, this isn't a science. It, it's the paranormal for a reason. So I can only answer based on my research and my beliefs. I can't say I'm 100% right because, you know, I there is no way to prove that I'm right. But, um, you know, so, you know, I'm very open about it. But I talk to a lot of people that are so secretive. They don't want to share the places that they're going. They don't want to share the new equipment. They don't want to share their techniques because they think somebody's going to steal it and be the first to get it on television. So it's really hard, you know, to kind of see what a conclusion should be and to kind of guide these new groups into what they should be doing because a lot of them are in it for the wrong reasons to begin with. You know, when you start it from for the wrong reasons to from the get go, 
Well, there is no conclusion. There is nothing that you can really say about their group. Um, you know, I mean, it's just, it's one of those where they, they won't hear it anyway. They think they're right and they think that they're going to have the next big thing and they think they're going to be famous. And that's really the main focus. And, you know, so unfortunately, this has really been hurting the paranormal community. And, um, uh, you know, like I said, you said, like they throw the word scientist, we're doing it from science, we're doing it for this, we're doing it for that. But a lot of groups that I've come across who tell me that, like, hey, we're a scientific leaning group, and this is what we do. They're usually the ones that I have these huge fight with fights with because they don't want to believe that an orb is a piece of dust. They don't want to believe that a reflection on the wall is actually coming from a window and bouncing off and was captured by the camera. And it's not actually paranormal because then you are taking away from what they could possibly use to get ahead in the field and to try to get their name out there and to try to get paid to do lectures or to get on TV. And, you know, and it's so it, Again, we're fighting with, you know, the the state of the paranormal field right now. So it's really hard to answer the question you put forth because a lot of groups are just in it for the wrong reasons. And so there really is no conclusion. One of our listeners in the SOR Space Travelers Club, Gail, she actually Googled the scientific approach to paranormal. And this is what she typed out here. Hi, Gail. It's, It says, the scientific method is a body of techniques for investigating phenomena, acquiring new knowledge, or correcting and and integrating previous knowledge. To be termed scientific, a method of inquiry is commonly based on empirical or measurable evidence subject to the specific principles of reasoning. Now, those are a lot of big words for people in this community. And, yeah. <laughs> I'm, uh, you know, and I'm not trying to be insulting to people, okay, but when you're watching Ghost Hunters or when you're, uh, or you're watching any of these television shows, yeah. they go to a place that's already haunted. Everybody knows it's already haunted. Yeah. And then they, at the end of the show, they sit down with the curator or whoever it is and they say, guess what? Your place is haunted. Oh! <gasps> my god exactly (laughs) oh my god it's haunted like can you believe this it's haunted right and that's but that's the schooling and the education everyone is getting because there is no education in this field so when they sit there and say you know we use scientific method and scientific approach not if you are trying to base a conclusion on just getting evidence getting evidence is not a conclusion you need to be able to have direction. And I think yep. in the end, and maybe you agree with me, maybe you disagree with me, that is what is completely hurting the possibility of science actually taking this study seriously because everyone and their dog can do it. Everybody yep. and their dog yeah. can, can take their money, invest it in all this gear that they don't need, Okay, but they have to have exactly. it because yeah. the other group has it, and then go forward. Yeah, I mean, exactly. How, how many groups out there that you know of personally, and you don't have to name names, Andrea, okay, but how many groups out there do you know of personally that don't know what to do if a spirit wants to leave? Oh, I, I mean, I've encountered numerous. Like I said, I've been having my busiest year of my entire life, you know, because I, I call myself the paranormal Ronin. And that means in Japanese, Ronin means masterless samurai. And I consider myself a groupless investigator. I have people that I work with, but for the most part, I like to have the freedom of being able to travel from place to place, different cities, different states to help people in need, to help other groups that, you know, need somebody who's actually been doing this a lot longer than they have because they don't understand or they want to learn and they, you know, come and they ask for my advice. So I'm kind of free in that way. So, but I've been extremely busy because I've had a lot of people, especially one, I just got called in and uh, the group said, look, you know, we don't know what to do. They had another group in here. The other group came in and they were doing all of this. You know, they, they claimed to, you know, do the scientific method and that they were going to find answers for this, you know, the, the person. I can't really, you know, go into it, obviously, for privacy reasons. But then all they really did was they came in, they riled the spirits up. They were very insulting. They were rude. They were 
you know, doing a lot of provoking. And then they said, oh, yeah, you know, we got some really great evidence of the paranormal. Like, look, this you see this orb here. There's a demonic face in this orb and just scared the crap out of the person. And they came in and they said, you know what? We do feel there is paranormal investigation you know, or paranormal things happening here. But like the, the picture of the orb that had the demon face, that was dust. I mean, this was obviously dust, but they have her convinced that it was something demonic. And we just don't know how to handle this. We're still new. We don't know what to do. So they called me in to come and help them um, to have. And there's so many cases of that lately because of people who don't know what they're doing and they get in over their heads and they make promises that they can't keep or they're not what I would call objective. They go in with the mindset that it is 100% without a doubt paranormal and they're going to find proof. I mean, if, if you think that something is paranormal, you're going to find proof of the paranormal. I mean, somebody's going to fart and you're going to swear you hear a word in that fart. You know, it, it's going to be paranormal whether, you know, it is or not because you have that mindset. So they don't know what they're doing. And then it just makes more work for me. <laughs> you know, it just gets because they get in over their heads. And that is one of the biggest problems we have right now in the paranormal field. And it, it, it does kind of irk me a lot. Like I can understand the interest. But if you're not going to get in it for the right reasons, don't get in it because these are real people that you're dealing with. These are real homes. And there's a lot of them. I deal with people that are terrified. And I don't want some person in there that sees a show on TV and says, hey, I can do that. I can buy a K2 meter for $50 and I'm an investigator. And then they go to this terrified person and say, hey, look, there's a demon in this orb. You know, and it, it's, it does get frustrating for me. Like when I, when I talk about that, I get so mad. Oh, and then I go off on a tangent. So, well, we're going to get into demons in the next hour. And I want to finish up with this whole science thing because we got about 10 minutes left here before we're going to go to our first break of the night. When you hear these groups and you know they're popping up left right and center and it's amazing how in every group there's someone who's been doing it for 20 plus years and that one is a head scratcher to me and I'm not trying yeah. to I'm not trying to sound you know naive or anything like that or to put people down but it's amazing how many people have been doing this for 20 plus years and yeah. yet they still have no diagnosis for what they are to do in a haunted situation. So when you have people who come up to you looking for advice, looking for your interest and your intrigue and the way you investigate, because for some reason all paranormal teams want to know how each other investigates, what, yeah. do, you, what do you tell these people? Because that conversation can go many different ways. Oh, and it always goes wrong for some reason. Because, um, you know, the way I investigate, I do go and I investigate and I try to find out what type of a haunting is it in the first place. Are we dealing with an actual ghost? Are we dealing with something that's intelligent? Is it residual? Which means it's not because re residual haunting is a misnomer. Residual is just leftover energy. It's not actually a spirit you can interact with or get rid of. Um, are we dealing with a case of an inhuman? I mean, what are we dealing with? That's the first thing that we need to take care of. Then we need to kind of go into the different ways that the spirit can be, you know, taken care of. And like I tell them, I'm very blunt. I say, I am Catholic. I am a Catholic demonologist. I've studied theologies of various different religions within Catholicism, as well as other sects of Christianity and outside of Christianity, but I deal personally as a Catholic, and I can tell you what I do as a Catholic for, you know, cleansings, and I, I can lead you into the right direction, but if you're not open religiously, because there's so many people that aren't religious or that are spiritual but don't believe in, you know, different kinds, like they believe in God, and but they don't believe in organized religion, and that's where it gets a little difficult, and then you start to get a lot of, like, the arguing about who's right, who's wrong, and I said, look, this works for me. I've had success with this. I have, you know, had clients that have come up to me and said, you know, they they thank me because, you know, they've had it taken care of. Um, sometimes it, I have to go back a couple times and do it, but eventually it does get taken care of. 
I said, this is what works for me. If it doesn't work for you, that's fantastic. But this is how I do it. And if you want to learn from me, I'm more than happy to explain everything. I'm more than happy to share with you the files that I have on theology, the files that I have on demonology, the all the prayers and the um, rites and the rituals. I'm happy to share that kind of thing with you and explain it to you and try to have a debate with you. But a lot of times, if you mention the word religion, they just kind of shut you down anyway. So it's very hard for me to actually explain how I do things because they, in the end, don't want to hear about it because they don't want God being brought to it because, like I said, some of them are atheist or some of them are of a different religion or some of them are agnostic where they maybe believe in something, but they really don't. They don't know and they just don't want to talk about it. And so the debate gets shut down and really what they want to hear from me is what kind of equipment do I use and what, you know, what have I captured? What's been the best paranormal experience? They don't want to hear about what I do to help people if it involves religion. So unfortunately, when it comes to me being a demonologist, working with the Catholic Church, working with priests across the country, it it is a very religious thing for me. So, you know, if people don't want to hear about that, you know, there's nothing I can do. But if they do want to hear about it, and they want to learn about it, and they want to know more about it, then I'm always willing to talk about it. And I think there, that's an important part, because as someone who does not go to church, I have, I'm one of the people you described. I am, yeah. a big, I am a big believer in God. I, I, you know, I'm on his bandwagon and everything like that. But I choose not to go to church because in my, yeah. own, in my own perception, I have drawn a real line between my own personal spirituality and belief and religion. To me, they're two, yeah. se- they're two separate entities altogether. You know, and I realize that when you're playing with spirits and you're playing with ghosts, whether they're demonic or they're benevolent or whatever you want to call them, there is a side of religion that goes into that, in my opinion, because this is what the Bible speaks of. This is what has been told that the spirits continue on to the other side. But it still gets back to the whole scientific question that you say, you know, there's a lot of atheists who do this. There's a lot of agnostic yeah. people who do this. doesn't matter whether you're, you know, Hindu, you're, you're Sikh, you're Muslim, you're pagan, or whatever your religion is. Yep. So one way or another, that religious conversation is always going to come out of the paranormal field yet people like you said are having troubles accepting that so when you try and explain that to people who want to go all scientific they're going on the science board that we're going to prove this we're going to be the ones and you say well actually there is answers if you read the bible or you listen to and do some religious study that has to be a tense conversation andrea it is, you know, and well, it, it, like I said, sometimes it is, sometimes you just get shut down completely and there is no conversation. And like I said, you know what, it's fine. If you have something that works for you, I'd love to hear it if you're willing to share it and, you know, maybe implement it and see if it works for me. But, you know, if you're going to come to me and you're going to ask me for my opinions as somebody who's been doing this for over a decade and, you know, somebody who has helped a lot of people and you know has learned a lot about myself as you know as well as the spiritual world you know i i can share with you everything that i know but if religion is going to you know be a i, I guess the i guess the nice way to put it a bug up your tushy you know then really there's nothing i can do to help you i w- i'm willing to talk about it if you're open to debate But, you know, if you shut me down right from the get-go, then neither of us are going to learn anything, you know, and then it just kind of, we get to a standstill. So, you know, like I said, if you don't believe in religion, that's perfectly fine, but hear my point of view, and I love to hear your point of view. I love to talk to people from all over, all different, I'm anti-Ouija board, but I have a friend who is extremely into the Ouija board. She uses the Ouija board all the time, and I'm willing to hear what she has to say about it. I sure as heck, I'm never going to use one, but I'm willing to listen to her. I'm willing to have that debate with her, you know, and, you know, it's just a matter of you have to be open and willing to listen to all sides. And that sometimes includes a religious aspect because there is some kind of a spiritual, when you're talking about a spiritual sense, you're talking about something that goes beyond life, that goes beyond science. And so you would have to say it is spiritual. So there has to be some sort of a religious base to it or a religious tone to it. 
you know, and you could deny that or you can find a way to talk around that and that's fine. But if you want to debate that or if you want to learn about that, you know, then you can come to me anytime you want to. Well, and that is the conversation that many are going to have. Me, I'm, I don't own a Ouija board, but I think it's funny that people will say no to the Ouija board, but yet they'll douse or they'll use a, a ghost box or a spirit box or something like that to communicate. You know what I'm saying? See, it's- you know, I, I find that, well, I don't dow- I don't use dowsing rods. I don't use, I'm not a big fan of the spirit box, you know, with the radio, you know, the, you know, where, because I, I find like, you know, if it finds a clear channel, it's going to come through regardless if there's a spirit in the room or not. So I usually, but when it comes to like EVPs, like somebody told me that an EVP is just like, there's nothing different from an EVP versus a Ouija board. And I could get into the whole Ouija board debate, which I won't. Um, I have it on my website. If you go to paranormal ronin.blogspot.com you know i have the ouija board debate there but there really is a difference for one when you're having the ouija board you have the planchette and you have to invite the spirit to use you physically in order to move the planchette in order to get the answers whereas i can put a ouija bo- or not a ouija i could put a um voice recorder down and say look you know if you got anything to say to me you can say it but i i gotta go and get a pizza and i'll be back in about 20 minutes and i could leave the building and then come back collect it and leave the building again and then listen and i could have potential evps you being there is not and acting as a conduit is not something that's a requirement of getting an EVP session, whereas you actually being used as the conduit to move the planchette and letting the spirit manipulate your physical body is one of the requirements of the Ouija board. And so to me, I mean, personally, again, this is my this is my belief, and I don't bash anybody who uses the Ouija board. If that's what works for you, that's fine. I just personally don't like to do it. But um, I do feel that there is a little bit of a difference. And on that note, we're going to hop out for our first break of the night. Andrea Message is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. We'll be right back after this break. Looking for news beyond the mainstream news? Head to spacedoutradio.com and check out the SOR Spacewire. This is Spaced Out Radio's Eric Markham, news director for the SOR Spacewire. Daily, I will bring you intriguing stories and outlandish reports from what's going on around the world. UFO sightings, paranormal activity, conspiracies, alternative health, and so much more. And if you have news, email me at news at spaceoutradio.com. Hi there. I'm Butch Witkowski, lead investigator with you 4 cop On the final Monday of every month, you can listen to me and host Dave Scott on Spaced Out Radio's Strange Days. We're going to get to the heart of the matter when it comes to what's happening out there. People are seeing and experiencing things from ET contact to Bigfoot, and I want to hear about it. Your experiences are what we investigators need to help solve these unknown mysteries. So tune in at spacedoutradio.com. Greetings and salutations, space travelers, from the Chronicles of the Unknown team. What is Chronicles of the Unknown? I keep hearing about this thing. It's a new paranormal reality TV show based right here in beautiful British Columbia, Canada. Follow our team as we uncover claims of activity on the Caribou Gold Rush Trail. You can also follow us here every third Monday where two members of our team will be available to answer your questions. Have you ever wondered about those weird and strange creatures people have reported throughout history? Do you wonder if those stories are real? Me too, and that's why I started Cryptopia.us. Hey, this is Rob Morphy, crypto historian. Join me once a month on Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott, where we will get into the odd and bizarre reports, from the Dover Demon to Harry Hominids and everything in between. I will break down what people like you and me are seeing at spacedoutradio.com. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit, and expect a miracle. 
strange creatures lurking in the night, the sounds of wood knocking in the forest, odd happenings right out of a fictional world. These are the reports I love. Hi there, this is author Ronald Murphy, and I would love it if you'd join me and Spaced Out Radio host Dave Scott the second Wednesday of every month on our journey into the unknown land of cryptozoology at spacedoutradio.com. From Mothman to Frogman and everything in between, hey, they don't call me the crypto guru for nothing. Are you interested in advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Head to our website at spacedoutradio.com and click on our advertising tab. There, you will find an assortment of ways you can get your product out there with us, from radio commercials to banners and social media. Have a product you like our hosts to endorse? We can do that too. Visit spacedoutradio.com for more details. From British Columbia to Northern California, Pacific North Weird has Cascadia covered. Check out our feature videos at spacedoutradio.com where I, Vincent Zunza, and my super sleuth partner, Alexandra Sullivan, track down the weird and strange stories from around the Pacific Northwest. From Bigfoot to Mel's Hole and everything in between. This is what makes life exciting. So why report the normal when we can report the Pacific North Weird? Right here at spacedoutradio.com. Oh, there's only one way to rock. Loud and proud. In high definition. Radio 702 Rocks. Las Vegas. Have you ever had an extraterrestrial experience? One you just couldn't explain? Well, maybe I can help. Hello, I am Samantha Mullis. On the second Tuesday of each month, I will join Dave Scott on Space Out Radio to bring a human aspect to ET contact. It's something I've lived with my entire life, and I'd love to help you understand. Let's share our experiences. The ET experience, the second Tuesday of each month, only on Space Out Radio. Hi there, this is Jolene with Revealer Reiki and Readings, and I want you to relax. Let me help you chill out and get in touch with your body, mind, and soul. In this busy world, sometimes we need to let go, and this is where I can help. Visit my website, rivuletrnr.wix.com forward slash rivuletrnr. Every Saturday and Sunday night, as Dave Scott wanders aimlessly in the wilderness, you can come hang out with me, James Tyson, and Spaced Out Weekend. Starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, I'll take you along as we talk with some of the best experts in their fields. SpacedOutRadio.com is the place to find us. So sit down, relax, put your feet up, enjoy the topics like the paranormal, supernatural, intuitiveness, and so much more. Hope to see you there. Hi there. This is your psychic medium, Joanna, and I would love it if you would join us every other Sunday on Spaced Out Weekend. With host James Tyson, we'll bring you personal psychic messages on two mediums and a large. Questions about love, life, career changes. We would love it if you would come and join us live. Call in and listen in for the experience. Allow us to open the doors to your other side. Two mediums and a large. Heard only on Space Out Weekend at spacedoutradio.com. Would you like to become one of our space travelers? All you have to do is click on the space travelers icon at spacedoutradio.com. For only $5 a month, you can get access to some great prizes, as well as private monthly shows, newsletters, and a members only section on our website. Become a space traveler today. Do you have a topic or a guest that you'd like to hear on Spaced Out Radio? Let us know at spacedoutradio.com where you can sign up to become a Space Traveler member today. Or you can find us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on our Facebook page, Spaced Out Radio Show. Welcome back to Spaced Out Radio tonight. Second hour is underway. Tomorrow night on the show, we will be joined by James Borg from Euphoria Chronicles and Audrey the Pleiadian. Yes, we're bringing in our resident alien tomorrow night. Literally, he's an alien. I've seen signs. I've confirmed it by my own eyes. That's tomorrow night, 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time at spacedoutradio.com. Hey, if you want to follow us on Twitter, well, you can do so at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. On Instagram, I can be followed at Dave Scott, S-O-R. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show, for our archives. And our website 
is spacedoutradio.com. While there, you could sign up for the SOR Space Travelers Club. It's only 5 bucks a month. With that, you get private access to a private section on our website. You get your name put into monthly draws and so much more. You can check out our resident guitar god, Ron Bumblefoot Thal, formerly of Guns N' Roses, who is the official music of Spaced Out Radio. Read up on our SOR Space Wire, and you can check out our blog section as we change our writings up daily. We have some creative writers on our team so make sure you read up on those as well everything at spacedoutradio.com so tonight we are talking with paranormal author and investigator andrea message she's an incredible well-spoken woman when it comes to the field of the paranormal andrea welcome back thank you you forgot to mention i'm cute yes you are gorgeous i'm not gonna i am i'm I'm not gonna (laughs) lie about that and i'm single (laughs) well you know, I know that's going to send Joe Allgaier just crazy now in the <laughs> SOR Space Travelers Club. He has probably the nicest the nicest hair of any man I've ever seen. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> anyhow, anyhow, a couple of questions from our audience from that first hour. This one comes from Gail. Okay. How do you think a spirit is able to make contact physically by scratching, clawing, or biting or anything like that? Well, you see, there again, we get into the opinion. Um, Again, I can't offer any scientific evidence because I could tell you what I believe, but I can't prove about what I believe. But basically, I think there are different categories. I think as you get towards the more malicious entities, I believe that they're the ones that are able to manipulate you a little bit more. Uh, When it comes to like demons, Uh, demons used to be angels. They were creations of God that fell from heaven after rebelling against God. There were multitudes. We don't know how many that is. It could be billions upon billions. But they fell, but they kept their angelic powers, and angels are very strong, and angels can actually manipulate you. They are not angels. I should say demons. Demons can manipulate you. They can interact with you. They can possess you for crying out loud. They can, when we talk about things that can move objects, like, like actually lift refrigerators and lift those, the something with that kind of power is usually what, and me personally, again, this is just going to what I believe is demonic. Um, so when you're talking about physical manipulation, such as scratching, choking, pushing, shoving, yes, a a spirit, like a lesser spirit, can have the energy to do that. They can build the kinetic energy from taking the things around them. Like um, when we hear a lot about electromagnetic fields, one of the beliefs is that in order to manifest and in order to gain power, it takes the electromagnetic fields, whether it's man-made or natural, in order to build that kind of power, in order to interact. But the stronger the interaction and the more, um, I would say, malicious the interaction, then I start to lean towards a lot of times you could be dealing with more of the demonic especially as you get into like shoving somebody down a a flight of stairs like um, happened to one person as I was walking upstairs I felt hand around my ankle and it actually yanked me down and I ended up sliding down the stairs on my stomach after I fell Um, so it, it kind of it's one of those where it's kind of I opine you know I make an opinion I can't prove it but I believe a lot of it has to do with the demonic hierarchy, the demonic choir of angels, so to speak, and you know the powers that they still have and that they still maintain all of their angelic energy, all of their angelic powers where they can actually still physically manipulate things in this realm. And as you get down to where you're talking about human hauntings, you find that less and less. You find that they're a lot weaker, that they you know, they can maybe manipulate a ball, you know, balls easy to move, you know, because it's round. I mean, so if you push a ball, it's going to move no matter how much energy you actually put into it. Um, So but when you're talking about the scratches, I think you're talking about more of a stronger demonic force a lot of times. Um, But when you're talking about humans, I don't think they can interact with you on that level that maybe they can pull your hair, maybe they can touch you, maybe you can feel them tap you. But um, again, that has to do with energy that has to do with taking things from around them that's in our from like things that we can actually measure like electromagnetic fields. People think that's a word that's created by paranormal investigators to sound smart, but really it's actually something that functions with plumbers and electricians. 
Um, and of course, like I said, there's natural electromagnetic fields in the earth as well. And they use all of that to try to build up as much energy as possible in order to interact with us on our level into something that we can feel. Um, so I believe it has to do with electromagnetic fields. It has to do with the energy that they take from around them, man-made, natural, in order to manifest. But the stronger the interaction, the more malicious the interaction, then I believe we're dealing with something that's a lot more powerful on its own, doesn't need to build energy from the things around us that because it's, you know, a spiritual force that we're dealing with that could be demonic. So, you know, it's kind of depends. But again, this is my opinion. I'm not saying that I'm right. You could hear a lot of different opinions about it. But this is just what I believe and what I've come to found uh, to find on my investigations. And we have a question from KJ in the SOR Space Travelers Club, and she is asking, in all of your paranormal research, have you ever come across extraterrestrial contact? Me personally, I have not. I actually am one of those paranormal investigators where I, I believe in ghosts. I'm still very skeptical. Like, I, you know, I don't believe everything that I see is a ghost. I don't walk into a place and automatically think that it's haunted. In fact, I've, you know, come to many conclusions many times that there really wasn't a haunting going on at the location. I mean, that for me is more normal than actually finding something. Um, so I'm still kind of, I still have that little skepticism about me, but you know, I, at, when it comes to aliens, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I, I'm, I'm agnostic when it comes to aliens. I don't not believe because I think there has to be something more out there. Otherwise, why would God create billions and billions and billions of planets and stars and, you know, all these different cosmoses just for us? You know, I, so there's got to be something more out there, but I haven't had any personal experiences that I know of. I mean, there might have been experiences that I had and I didn't realize that it had, you know, to do with aliens or UFOs or extraterrestrials. I mean, you know, because a lot of people say aliens are already among us, that aliens look human. So who knows? I might have been talking to a whole bunch of different aliens and never know it, you know. And I'm not saying that, you know, slapstick-wise. I mean, I'm, I'm honestly saying I don't know if I have or not. The Polding Lights, which is also in my book, Ghost in the Coal Cellar, one of the theories behind the Polding Lights, which is something that I researched, one of the theories is extraterrestrial, that they are extraterrestrial lights. So, you know, that is, I mean, I guess I had kind of like a close encounter in that way. You know, I, I personally believe it's more on the paranormal than extraterrestrial, but I don't, I haven't had what I can say is an extraterrestrial experience. I'm not 100% sure I believe in aliens yet, but I am also not discounting the fact that they could be out there. Um, I'm not discounting the things that I have heard from other people who are very believable people. They aren't people that seem to, like, you know, be lying to me. You know, they, they you could see in their faces that, you know, the tears in their eyes, that they truly honestly believe what they're talking about when it comes to abduction or actually coming face to face with what they believed was an alien or a UFO. Um, so I don't discount it. I'm not saying that I never had one. I'm saying maybe I had one, but they were hidden or maybe they were posing as human. I don't know. It's always in the realm of possibilities. When you're dealing with the paranormal, anything could be possible and we just don't know it yet. Well, as an alien experiencer, I will tell you they are 100% true. Yeah, yeah. Especially when I've had them show up at my window while I'm broadcasting. That's not fun. Yeah. Not, no, are no. they are they like the ones with the big eyes or are they oh, human yeah. looking? Um, let's see. I've seen five extraterrestrials wide awake. Uh, four of them have been grays. One was a larger gray. Three were the little grays. I actually woke up on the table right before they implanted me. And the first one that I saw in April of 2014, he was about 10 to 12 foot high. I don't even know how to describe him. Kind of like what... Um what they talked about, like fire in the sky kind of type? Uh, not that evil looking. No. Th this was a very benevolent type being. Because, no, I've heard that they there are people, because like I said, I don't discount it. I, I've never had an experience, so I can't say I let I believe just because I, I'm one of these, I got to see it to believe it types. That's how I was with the ghosts. I didn't believe it until I had my experience. But I have heard that people have said there are aliens among us that are either disguised as humans 
or have possibly interlaced their species with humans and look human or, you know, are somehow they have a human form where they could pass as human. Have you ever experienced that? I haven't seen one as a human that I would know. I do know that in research that there are, they are out there that you wouldn't even know. Okay, I have met one extraterrestrial. He will be on tomorrow night. And, you know, he t- it's very hard for him to come out. He actually gave me yeah. a couple signs um, to prove to me that he is what he says he is. And he goes by Audrey. And some of the features that he has shown me privately and I won't I, I haven't asked him if I could talk publicly about it so I don't well, sure, yeah. I don't talk publicly about it because he's got to watch himself but it has really made me kind of cringe in a way of oh my god not not out of fear but yeah. out of out of the way like oh my god this is real this is yeah. like I would never expect that you yeah. know and it's funny talking you know, to him I'm, because he doesn't even show emotion yeah. Really? Is he in, like he doesn't show emotion as in he's not capable of of human uh, emotion or just doesn't know how to express human emotion? I don't think he knows how to express it. Okay. Like when you talk with him, it's very monotone. His levels never go up, they never go down, he never gets excited, he never gets down, you know, like his voice is always strictly the same. You know, yeah. it, it just never changes. And to me that's that's kind of weird because when people speak to you on a human level, you know, yeah. like we're speaking tonight. I mean, when you when you get emotional about something, your voice goes gets a little bit higher, you speak a little <laughs> exactly. bit faster, you yeah. know, and but this is straight even keel, straight across yeah. the board. And you know, there will be detractors out there as there are in this field by saying, you know, people saying, "Oh, this do- he doesn't exist or he doesn't uh, want to, uh, you know, this isn't true. Somebody's pulling your or leg." Or he's crazy. Dave. He's Exa- crazy. Exactly. They'll say, you know, he's mentally unstable and that he needs to be medicated. You know, like we Absolutely. talked about earlier. Absolutely. Yeah. But I, I, I will say this, and I'm going to keep this very quiet. I have seen mm-hmm. uh, a body part of his that he showed me on on a Skype conversation that if you looked at it, it would be totally unbelievable. Yeah. And that's what has me convinced that yeah. I'm talking to the real deal here. And... Uh, it, it's hard to accept. I still struggle with that. Yeah. You know, I still struggle with it. And, but what do you do? Exactly. What- you know, I was kind of jokingly say, you know, I'm more than open for the existence of aliens because I've pretty much exhausted all of my efforts finding a good guy here on Earth. So, you know, it'd be, to me, it'd be kind of nice if there were, you know, human, human-esque alien guys that are single, you know, maybe I'll find somebody that meets, you know, my personality and my eccentricities, you know. So I'm more than open to the fact that they could exist. I haven't had that experience. Maybe when I listen to the show when Audrey's on and, you know, I, I can maybe experience a little bit of it then. Um, but like going back to the person who asked the question, I can't say that I've ever had that experience. And so I, my mind still is in that, well, I, okay, there is that possibility, but I don't know because I haven't actually witnessed it myself. So, you know, I, I'm not closed. Like I said, I used to be closed minded to everything, Bigfoot, ghosts, the Loch Ness Monster, aliens. But after my very first experience, that made me re-question everything in my life. I was even like, you know, like I believed in God. I believed in Jesus. And, you know, but I was one of those. They had to force me to go to church. They had to force me to, you know, because I, I just, I'd rather sleep on Sunday. And I didn't feel the connection. Like there wasn't a connection with God. I didn't pray. I never prayed. Like I, the last time I prayed, I was a little kid. And then after this experience, that actually brought me back to my religion. You know, it brought me back to being a better Catholic. I pray all the time now, and I use my faith to help other people. So I'm one of these, like, you got to be baptized by fire, I guess. You know, like, if I had the experience, it, you know, I'll accept it. You know, I, I accept that it's possible now, but I still kind of want to experience it for myself. I want to meet one. I want to talk to one. I want to see something. I mean, I've seen something in the sky 
that I 100% cannot say, you know, it, it wasn't a shooting star because shooting stars don't go very slowly and then all of a sudden pick up speed, pick up speed, and then shoot back in the other direction like a boomerang, you know. So, and I've witnessed something like that before. So that, you know, I can't explain. But I want to see more before I can honestly say, okay, yeah, I, I completely 100% undeniably believe in aliens. I mean, that, that's just me, but um, I'm open to it. And I would love to learn more and I would love to experience it. And I'd love to talk to somebody, you know, who's had experiences um, like Mr. Walton from Fire. I'd love to interview him. I'd love to pick his brain. I'd love to, you know, listen to your next show when you have Audrey on and just listen to, you know, all of that, you know, and to see if I could have that experience that I've been looking for. A couple more or another question from the SOR Space Travelers Club. This one comes from J.A. And J.A. is asking, do you think, Andrea, more than one spirit can have the same agenda, such as exposing a secret motive behind their unsolved murder? That more than one spirit at the same time for the same thing? Is that what y- y- J.A. Yes. means? Yes. Oh, definitely. I I mean, there have been many cases where, I mean, I obviously don't investigate murders myself. Um, you know, that would be very sad for me to do. If I ever had to, I would. But um, when like, for example, if we're talking about like a lot of psychics or people who are empathic that have helped the police, and they do it on the download, they're not like, you know, you, you know, they don't like to advertise the fact that they do this, they kind of do it on the download and they, but they have investigated and they have said that, you know, multiple spirits reach out to them. In fact, spirits that aren't even related to the case, like maybe they were in already haunting the location when it happened and they were witnesses, you know, like, you know, like you have a witness to like somebody stealing, let's say you walk into a convenience store and there's somebody stealing a candy bar and running out the store and you tell the police what the person looked like, what they were wearing, you know, you're a witness to that event. Well, you know, the spirit, she said at this one point, was a witness to this very unfortunate event. And she was able to bring not only the person that was still there, the victim that was still there, who was trying to tell her story, but then there was a witness that came forth to corroborate that story. And then she went to the police and said, you know, told the police everything that she knew from these two different spirits that were coming to her that were completely unrelated. One was the victim, one was a witness. And they were actually able, after the fact, maybe I think within a month, to find the person who, it was a hit and run accident, the person took off but they were able to find the person that did it and charge them with vehicular manslaughter after the fact. So I do believe that spirits, even unrelated to each other, can come together. I mean, at the museum that I'm currently, I I was working on ghost tours at this one particular museum, and there are multiple spirits there. They're not related to each other. They have no connection to each other. They're there for whatever reason, whether they came in with an item that's at the museum or it's an area that they've lived and they wanted to stay there, or that's a place where they died because at one time it was a hospital. Um, you know, but they're all there for their own different reasons and they do interact with one another. I mean, I have multiple EVPs of interactions between the spirits, you know, it's not always friendly and sometimes, you know, they seem to have their arguments, but they do come together a lot of times for a shared purpose or they actually will commune together as like a, almost like a mini family, like an afterlife family trying to figure out where to go from here or, you know, so it is very possible for that to happen. At least that what I've come to experience and research. <clears throat> you mentioned psychics. Yeah. And lately I've actually gone off and I don't mean to harp on this topic lately because I have a lot of <laughs> I have a lot of really good psychic friends as I think anybody yeah. in this field does and there yes. are certain ones that you trust with their opinion and their oh, definitely. knowledge because for some reason they can just read you perfectly. Samantha Mowat yeah. Samantha Mowat, who does an ET show with us the second Tuesday of every month, is one of those people for me. And she was actually over at my house just a couple of nights ago helping me out because I've been having a kind of a tough time with, with some things. Anyhow, yeah. long story short, where do you put in the group of paranormal activity and paranormal research, where do you put psychics on a pedestal because there's some groups out there who believe that they shouldn't investigate without a psychic there are groups out there who say that a psychic is no good in the paranormal field where do you stand i stand in 
I am the kind of person who will accept anybody that's interested in the paranormal to come with me. And I use them to the best of my abilities because I'm curious. You know, I mean, it is something that I am curious about because I've had that, you know, issues myself where I've had dreams that have come true or sometimes like waking, like, and for example, somebody was asking me if I was psychic in one of my ghost tours, because that's whenever you deal with the paranormal, the first thing they think is if you're a paranormal investigator, you're also psychic and that you dabble in all of this other stuff. And I was trying to tell her, well, you know, I I can sometimes when a spirit's around, I can sense when they're around and I can sense if they're malicious or, you know, I could sense they're kind of, you know, what they're there for their purpose. But I can't stand there. And there's this girl. I mean, she looked like she was about 14 years old. I didn't realize that she was already in her 20s. I mean, she was just, God, I wish I could look that young still. I mean, I but I thought she was there. She was there with her mom because nobody under 18 is permitted. So I thought she dragged her mom with her because she was underage. So I'm like, I can't look at you and say there's a guy there. And all of a sudden it popped into my head. There's a guy with a J. He's crossed over. It's a J. You know, it's a J name. Like, you know, John Edwards does. It's a J. It's a J name. And he's tall and he's kind of really, he's thin, but he, you know, he's muscular, but he's lean. And he's got mousy brown hair. It's all messed on top, but he's got a perfectly, you know, trimmed mustache. And, you know, he's crossed over. He's standing by you, this, you, the young girl. And she kept getting paler and paler and paler. And finally, I'm like, is everything okay? And she's like, well, you know, I'm a widow. And I was like shocked because, you know, I, at first I thought, like I said, she was a teenager, but she said, I'm a widow. My husband's name was Jeremiah and which is obviously a J name. He was tall and he was, you know, thin, muscular, but lean. And he did have, you know, brown hair, kind of messy. And towards the end of his life before he died, he had, you know, a nice mustache growing in that he, you know, used to trim up and that looked like a little nice mustache. And, I never even thought about it, but after the fact, when we exchanged Facebook pages, you know, and I kind of went and I looked at pictures and I'm like, oh my God, that's exactly who I saw, you know, and it's not something I can control. So I'm open to the fact that there are psychics out there and that there are psychics that do have talent. And I truly believe in like a lot of my friends who are psychic, you know, psychic mediums, I, you know, tested them and, you know, I really do have a deep understanding of them and they're not kind that like, you know, will predict the future. You know, they're not the ones that say, well, you know, in four years, you're going to find this guy and he's going to be, they're the kind that actually will tell you, look, this is, you know, you've been like missing these lessons. I want you to learn these lessons that you're avoiding. And and they're more of trying to make you realize something about yourself than more than telling about the future. And that's what I like about these particular ones is that they can connect with the spirit world and kind of put you on the right path rather than give you your lotto numbers, you know, like try to tell you things that'll happen 10 years from now. And who knows if you'd actually be around to actually see if it would come true or not. They are more like, you know, trying to build you up spiritually and, you know, build your character up and, you know, push you forward. So I, you know, if I have a good psychic medium that I do trust, I will bring them in there, you know, and I will see what they say, but I like to do what's called dry reading. I'll bring them in there and I won't tell them a single thing about what's going on. I won't tell them about anything that the family has told me. I won't even tell them anything about the history of the house. And then I let them go and do what they feel like they have to do. And then when they give me their report after they've walked through the house, I'll compare it. You know, I'll see this is what they're telling me. This is what she's telling me without absolutely any kind of, you know, like, you know, push to where this is like, you know, what you should be seeing or not. And, you know, and see what kind of like mesh it in that way. So I, I kind of do, I don't mind having, I don't have them on a regular basis. That's not really my thing. I like to go in and I like to try to do different experiments to try and communicate and like, you know, try to get like, you know, manipulation objects like balls to move or like, you know, I like to take, they have that boo bear now and I've made my own version of the boo bear that, you know, is a little less sensitive and talky where it doesn't just talk out of nowhere for no reason. Um, you know, and I like to do things like that. I like to kind of like do experimentation, things that I can physically tangibly see and feel and, and experience. But if there is a group that I'm working with and they do have a psychic, I do kind of pick their brain just to, you know, kind of experiment with it. I, I, you know, I'm open to all sorts of different techniques, except me personally, again, I, the only thing I won't do is a Ouija board. I don't say that you can't use it on an investigation, but I will leave before it's brought out. I, I'll ask to excuse myself from the building once they bring it out. 
But with psychics, yeah, I've, I've used psychics. I don't rely on them. I don't put them on a pedestal as a must have. But, you know, I'm more than open and willing to have them on an investigation with me. I think my biggest issue right now with anybody who is psychic is the fact of this. And I'm making a pregnant pause there because <laughs> I'm trying to build up the emotion to the moment. No, yeah, but, there you go. But, but, but seriously, I have dealt with a lot of psychics. And like I said, there's, there's some that I trust. And I, yeah. won't, I won't bring a psychic on this show to do any sort of reading unless I get a reading first. Yeah. Because I need to know how accurate they are. And here is something that in my own little non-scientific study that I have noticed. It is amazing how gifted some of these people are. Yeah. And, but to me, here's the difference that I've noticed. They are very gifted for the most part. And I'm not saying all. I know I'm lumping all psychics when I say they. But for yeah. the most part, most of them are very gifted at predicting anything that is negative or gloomy that is coming through. They can predict that quicker than a democratic convention can pick <laughs> Hillary. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but when it comes to something positive coming, whether it's money, whether it's love, whether it's an opportunity of a lifetime, whatever it may be. Maybe it's finding that, that new house or, or that roommate that's needed to help pay rent. Have you ever noticed that everything is always four, six, eight, ten, twelve 10, 12 months away? And, yeah, then when, yeah, and, then, yeah. and then when you finally get to that timeline that they said, it's another four, six, eight, ten 10 months away. Yeah. I, I am so sick of that. I know. That you see, and... And that's, I, that's okay, the psychic mediums that I know personally, um, like, for example, one, she's she's really sweet person, sweet girl, but she even tells me, she's like, don't ask questions like, when am I going to find love? Who is it going to be? Like, can you tell me the name of the, she goes, that removes your free will. The whole point of our lives is that we have free will. And anything can change our path of destiny. You know, we're not written in stone. So if you're asking me to tell you four years from now, if you're going to finally meet Mr. Right, she's like, you know, nothing can predict that because I could see somebody that you could be dating and then you decide to latch on to that guy. And then it turns out, I'll, you know, maybe see something else in the future. Like, oh, that's not going to work out. She's like, it's all about free will. You know, and and that's what I really love about her is that she's not doom and gloom. And and the ones that I know, they're not doom and gloom. In fact, I know one particular um, gentleman that I've spoken to on many occasions. He's never given me anything doom and gloom. What he does is he gives me something that uplifts me, that actually makes me feel better about myself, better about the situation, better about the world around me, makes me feel like I'm protected because I know that, like, he knows something about a relative of a couple relatives of mine that had passed away they were already crossed over that nobody else could possibly have known he said you know your grandmother wants you to know and he just said he goes i think he goes it's your grandmother and she wants you to know she's fine and she's with her sisters playing cards and that's you know that's something that nobody knows that my grandmother and her sisters used to play cards every saturday and it was a saturday when he was telling me when you know he gave me that um that message He's like, she go, he goes, she just wants you to know she's fine. She wants you to know your father's fine and that, you know, she and her sister are playing cards right now. And, you know, so it's always, it's very upbeat and it's not all doom and gloom. And that's why you have to, you know, it's kind of fun to go to a psychic to, you know, to talk to them and see what they're talking about. But I don't like to go and get my future predicted because like one of my friends said, that takes away your free will. And it's all about your free will. Don't worry about what's going to be happening 10 years from now because life paths change all the time because of free will. And you shouldn't want to know that far into the future because it removes your ability to live your life because you're so focused and you're trying to, you actually set yourself up to fail at that point. Um, and then, but you do have a lot of the doom and gloom psychics, the, the doomsdayers, the ones that'll predict the end of the world, you know, the ones that uh, say uh, an asteroid's coming for you, you know, in the year 2016. And, you know, and a lot of, and obviously they're proven wrong, 
I mean, they, they, they let set themselves up to be proven wrong, but, um, that's why you got to kind of be careful and you got to test them. It's like in the Bible, it says, test your spirits, you know, don't trust every spirit that comes with you, test them to make sure they're from God. And so if you're talking to somebody who says they're psychic medium, you test them, you know, and, and you see, you know, what kind of messages are they getting and who are they truly receiving it from? So, like I said, I don't put psychic mediums on a pedestal. But at the same time, I have some friends that I really do truly believe are gifted and they've helped me a lot with, you know, the things that I've gone through where I've, you know, had diarrhea of the mouth and have said something that turned out to be accurate or have um, had dreams and woken up and the next day they actually occur, you know, and, and they've been very, you know, positive and uplifting and guiding me along the way when it comes to something like that. But um, you have to, like, just when you're dealing with the paranormal, have anything, whether you're dealing with aliens or ghosts or psychics, or you just have to be careful and protect yourself. Exactly. And you know what? Use it for entertainment purposes. You know, because in the end, a lot of psychic people, they're good people who have a gift. Yep. And too many people become reliant on what a psychic says. And that's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of pressure on the people who are are getting the messages. Because in the end, they know they're not going to be 100% accurate. They know they're probably not going to be 70 or 80% accurate. But the one thing that they can do is relay a message. Whether or not you you do something with it, it's still your free will. And I think exactly. a lot and I think a lot of people forget that. They take the words ad nauseum or maybe what is said, they they don't like what the psychic said, so they go in a different path, not realizing that they're changing the path or the course that of the way things are supposed to be. And it yeah. does put psychic mediums in a hard position. So if you're going to a psychic medium to try and run your life, that's not their job. That's your job. Yeah. Because your free will out there is going to dictate whether or not that advice comes true or not. Exactly. If, they're in, if they're any good. Right? You know, and we're static. We're static people. We don't stand still. Our lives are not written in stone. That's the whole point of free will. Free will gives us a choice. And if we're just saying the psychic medium tells you, say that, oh, well, you should be getting this job in a year. Well, that's the one thing that she's seeing. But what about the three job offers coming through that she didn't see that might actually be better? It doesn't mean that she's wrong, but another opportunity presents itself and you decide to go, you know, against the grain. I mean, you can't live your life based on what they say. Like my one friend says, it's all about free will. She can guide you. She can tell you what she sees, but that doesn't mean you should just like live your life in a hole until you meet a guy named Fred, you know, wearing a red coat because, you know, maybe you're passing up on a whole bunch of other guys that she, you know, didn't, that didn't come through at that time. That's the whole point of free will. Free will is you got to live your life. Cog is asking a question in the Space Out Radio chat room on Spreaker. He's asking, Andrea, how do you test the spirits to know they're real? What do you mean, how do you test them? Like, oh, to, to know they're real? Like, yeah. oh, is, is he referring to like test the spirit? Like when I said test the spirits? Yes. Okay, it tests the spirits from a biblical standpoint, and again, I'm, I'm going to bring the Bible into it, so I do apologize to anybody who finds that offensive, but pfft, everyone's offended by something. Um, but biblically, when you're talking about testing the spirits to see if they are from God, what I believe, and I've encountered this on many occasions, a demon that wants to try to attach itself to you is always going to pose as your great-great-great-grandmom, and they know things about you and your family that may be you know, you don't even realize and then you research and it turns out to be true. And, you know, they have all of these little tricks to get you to lower your guard and accept the men because the one thing they need is that invitation to come into your life and run your life. And so they try to lower your guard by acting like your sweet grandma mom who passed over and you know, and so you kind of have to say, well, okay, well, if you, you know, like test them a little bit, like say, okay, well, my, you know, find out things that, well, do you know this? Do you know that? Do you know this? And see if they come up with those answers or if any answers seem off for some reason. And then bring God into it. I bring God a lot of times when I start talking because then all of a sudden you notice a change. They try to 
act like, oh, I am a religious spirit. I, I believe in God. But then their mentality, because they have such a deep seated hate for God, the, you know, in the demonic, I mean, the whole point demons is that they just hate God that much. Because, you know, God banished them and, and they've actually become so twisted and evil because of the fact that they hate God, that the more you tweak them and try to get them to proclaim God and to proclaim Christ and to say, you know, and to praise God, they get to a point where they just refuse to do it. And then all of a sudden their true colors come forth. So, you know, you have to kind of, that's where I say I bring God into it and I see just how far they're willing to go until they crack you know, and if they don't crack and if they do say, I believe in God and I want to cross over and I, I don't know how to cross over, if they're not showing any signs of cracking under the name of God, then I know sometimes we might be dealing with a human spirit. But like if you get a vicious pullback towards like, you know, where they just crack and then it starts to get kind of malicious and they start to curse or they start to fight back, well, then, you know, you've caught them posing as something benevolent when they're really not. And so that's how I test the spirits. When I say test the spirits, I'm talking more in a biblical sense. We're going to get into demons in the next hour here, and I'm just kind of setting that up. For a lot of people, there are questions in regards to whether or not how they can trust someone in the paranormal field, how they can trust, you know, a, an investigative team or trust a psychic medium for that point or anything along those lines. How would you define to someone who is searching for these teams to maybe come in and help at a, at a place of business or a residence to define the good from the bad? Well, for one thing, never be afraid to ask for references because a lot of times I have clients that while they don't want, obviously, their you know experiences, their names are where they live, they will like say, yes, this person did come in and help me and I really believe and trust in them and they will say, you know, they did help. Um, you can do background checks now. You, it, it's so easy to go online and do background checks and you know make sure you're not dealing – because I had actually one time – where I did, um, somebody did do a background check when they called me in to do an investigation because they had another investigative group. And this was, you know, and I forgot which state it was. I, I want to say it was um, somewhere out west a little bit. And they found out that um, they'd been convicted of theft. They've been convicted of breaking and entering into a cemetery and committing vandalism. Um, so obviously, background checks are very helpful. And then ask the questions. Find out, like, do some research online about the defendant and ask them and find out how knowledgeable that they are. Like, you know, does it sound like they're BSing? Like, does it sound like they're just pulling it out of a hat, you know, and trying to come up with something? Or does it sound like somebody who actually has been doing this and has the experience and the knowledge and the understanding? Um, and then just know one thing is I would say... 99% of paranormal groups, especially the paranormal, paranormal groups that are out there right now, 99% are not equipped to do cleansings. They can come in and they can give you, you know, like, well, yeah, here's evidence that something is going on in your home and then lead you to the right place in order to get help for the actual ridding of the spirit but most investigator investigative groups, if they tell you that they can cleanse your home personally and that and rid you of the spirit, I'd be very wary. Um, I would look at how long that they've been doing this, what kind of a background they have that makes them think that they, you know, can be cleansing. Did they study theology? Did they work with priests or other, you know, religious clergy of various different religions? What, you know, have they done to verify that they're able to cleanse a home without making a situation worse? I would really do research on that. Um, like me personally, I never did cleansings by myself before until I actually worked with priests across the country and, you know, those who have been exorcists and in their diocese. And, you know, they've taught me layman's prayers that, you know, I can do to help a person, especially with human spirits. But when it comes to the demonic, I still don't go it alone. I will not try to cleanse a home of a demonic spirit without the help of a priest, um, of the exorcist of the diocese, if possible, to come in and help with the cleansing. Because I know I can't do that. I know I'm not ready for something like that on my own. Um, I'll always refer, or sometimes I'll go to other demonologists that I have 
you know, that I know really well that I've worked with before who have been doing this for years and years and years. I mean, Ralph Sarchi is one name that pops up. Um, he is just, he's an excellent demonologist. And so I'll go to him for advice if I need to. Um, so I don't do it alone myself either, unless we're talking about a human spirit, which in itself, anyone can tell the human spirit, you know, it's time to go, you know, if you talk to them on their level, but um, be very careful. Just do your due diligence. Just research the group, research the person, do the background checks, ask them questions and see if they have knowledge and find out if they say they can cleanse homes, find out what their credentials for saying that is like, you know, find out what kind of experiences they've had, find out, you know, why, you know, what kind of way do they cleanse and how has it worked and see if you can get references. We have a question from Eric in the Spaced Out Radio chat room on Spreaker. He is asking, Andrea, do you find the prayer to St. Michael to be quite effective? I do. I actually carry a little card. I have a St. Michael card and a St. Michael me- uh, medal. Uh, for those who may not know, St. Michael, the archangel, is actually one of the patron saints of demonologists, paranormal investigators, and exorcists. Um, so I do carry a little card that has the prayer on it and I put it in my back pocket and I have it with me at all times. I actually use that to cleanse myself going in and going out so that I try to avoid any attachments to myself. I make sure that, you know, my guardian angel's praying for me, that St. Michael is praying for me and that I have, you know, that spiritual protection so that, you know, and I obviously, I also say no attachment is allowed because I don't give any invites. Invites is the number one way to get an attachment. So I, you know, do these prayers. I have my holy water. I bless myself going in and out. And um, I do pray the St. Michael prayer. I find it very powerful as well as Psalm 91. Psalm 91 is another one I pray all the time when I'm in a very tough situation paranormal wise. Um, And that's how I protect myself going in and going out to keep me from getting spiritual attachments. And it also seems to calm down a lot. Um, You know, if there's a lot of activity at a house, I'll say, read the prayer of St. Michael, read Psalm 91 when you're really feeling like things are going to be too much. And they say they do notice a calming effect in their home. So yes, definitely. I always have the prayer of St. Michael and I carry my St. Michael medallion with me wherever I go. What do you say to people, Andrea, who say, I just need the experience. I don't really care. I need to know that this is real, whether it's paranormal, whether it's extraterrestrial, whether it's crypto, like a Bigfoot experience. They just need to feel something, see something. On this show, we have mentioned a number of times that you really, for most part, most people out there don't really realize who've never had an experience that you have to be careful what you wish for. So when somebody comes up to you who's an amateur at this, but they really are are drooling for the experience, what's your advice to them? Well, the one thing that I would definitely say is if you're curious about the paranormal, and that's fantastic. I mean, you know, I have... I say that, you know, I'm not really scared of the paranormal anymore. Even when I go into the demonic, I I have a hard time of being overly afraid. I'm just more curious, you know, about different paranormal experiences. And that's that's fine. I mean, if you're curious and you want to experience it, great. But first of all, never go into somebody's home. One, if you're not experienced and you've never had a paranormal experience and you've never been on an investigation before, don't go messing with people's homes because you're just going to cause trouble there. You're going to stir things up and then leave them with the aftermath. Um, two, if you want to have an experience, find somebody or that like you like go to Mackinac Island. Uh, there's a place in Michigan called Mackinac Island. They have uh, haunted the, everything. I mean, that, that whole island is you know pretty haunted and you can go on paranormal investigations and they have like leaders in a group that will explain to you what they're doing explain to you the different types of hauntings they'll explain to you the equipment they're using and then they'll actually have you go and perform an investigation and it's in a place where they know the spirits nobody's been hurt the spirits are fairly, you know, they, they like to kind of play jokes on people. And I wrote about it again in my book, plugging it one more time, Ghost in the Coal Cellar. It, a hilarious experience happened at, on Mackinac Island at this particular theater that's haunted. But go to places like that. Take ghost tours or talk to your local 
local paranormal group, like a real trusted paranormal group, again, do your research and make sure you're finding a reputable group and ask if you can shadow them on an investigation of, say, a hotel or, you know, a business or something where you're not dealing with a terrified client that wants, you know, help. Because when you when you're dealing with a client that really wants help, that shouldn't be your learning experience. That shouldn't be the place that you're going to, you know, have your moment. That's that strictly, you know, you have to be there to help that person. So that's not a good place to do it. If you're going to go go to a haunted, go to the Stanley Hotel, go, like I said, to Mackinac Island and stay at the Straits Lodge at uh, Mission Point Resort or do the theater at Miss- Mission Point Resort. Go to those places that are public where people are welcome to come and have their experiences and then, you know, start there and then make that your starting point. And then if you have that experience and you want to learn more, then go to investigative groups and see what they can teach you and see if they can have you shadow them on on easier cases or on cases where people are less terrified and are more, you know, curious themselves and grow as an investigator in that way, but never ever start in the home of somebody who's scared and looking for answers. That's the one place you should avoid if you're just doing this out of curiosity. Joe has a question in the Space Out Radio chat room on Spreaker or on sorry on Facebook in the SOR Space Travelers, he is asking, if a place is haunted, then it burns down. Do the spirits, in your opinion, remain there? It depends. Um, Again, when we're talking about residual hauntings, um, they do remain, because a residual haunting has a lot to do with psychic energy and not so much a physical spirit. I actually dealt with a case that... um, they were having the house was it used to be a two story house, but then they turned it into a ranch after a fire had destroyed the attic area. And yet they still saw this teenage boy walking upstairs that no longer exist and disappearing into the ceiling. Well, they actually did the research. They, we were able to find who the boy was, and the boy was actually an old guy living in Florida. And he was still alive. He was living in a retirement community with his wife. Um, They showed him the picture that they found of who was haunting their house. And he verified that was him. And he he actually went through an album and showed them other pictures of him as a teenager. And they were able to say that is the guy. So a residual haunting doesn't necessarily have to do with somebody who's dead and a ghost. It's psychic energy. When we're talking about human hauntings, when we're talking about the intelligent hauntings, if the place is destroyed, now, just like us, I believe haunt spirits aren't stuck. I mean, the reason they're stuck is in their heads. You know, they want to be reminded of things of, of their mortality. They don't want to be reminded that they're dead. So they kind of attach themselves to people or to objects that remind them of their mortality. Now, if that is destroyed, then I do believe that some of them can pick up and leave. Um, but a lot of times they don't. Sometimes they're attached to that property or they're attached to that place or they're hoping that somebody will come and rebuild and that that is, they, they just refuse to go for whatever their reasons. So yes, there there is a chance that they can leave because I do believe, like I said, look at, and when it came to my first haunting, that spirit, I never had a paranormal experience in that. That was my childhood home. I grew up there. I lived there all my life. Never had an experience. All of a sudden, a spirit was able to travel to my house, come into my house, and I had an experience. Um, So obviously traveled there. So I do believe that spirits can detach themselves from a location and move on and haunt somebody else's house. Like if that house burns down and is never rebuilt, but there's a house next door, maybe they'll just go next door. But a lot of times, too, they are stuck there for whatever reason. And, you know, sometimes the area has to be cleansed to let the spirits go free. It just depends on the spirit and how much they understand about the world that they're now living. Do they understand that they're dead? Do they understand that they're free to come and go? Do they, you know, what is their level of understanding? Um, Or what is their attachment to the property? So, yes, they can remain. And, yes, they can go. Spirits are just like people. They have their moods. They have their beliefs. They have their, you know, like I said, they could be PMSing and just have a bad day and not want nothing to do with nobody. I mean, they have personalities just like we do. And so they're unpredictable. So you can't really predict what they would do if a place burnt down that they were haunting. Shar is asking in the Spaced Out Radio chat room on Spreaker, 
Do you think child spirits are stuck or is it something pretending to be a child? I'm, you know, I've always said to myself that I said, you know, I can't believe that God would allow a little child spirit to remain. Um, but you know what? There's, God has a reason for everything. Like I said, my first paranormal experience, I believe, was a wake-up call to return to you know, return to God, you know, and to return to religion. I believe that that's why I had these experiences because it was a message to me. Just like I believe, like sometimes when I have these dreams and I wake up and they come true, you know, they're inane things. Like I dreamt of a guy named Dave calling me, and then a guy named Dave calls me. I mean, it's inane, but yet it makes me think, and it kind of reminds me of like, you know, you know, maybe God's trying to tell me something, you know, so is it possible that children's spirit do remain here? I firmly believe they're, that they do. I actually encountered a full body apparition of a child, of a child spirit. And it was in a location where there was a malicious entity. And they believe they called the malicious entity the shepherd. And it was one of those where they tried to release the children. They tried to let the children go free. They were like saying, oh, let's go outside and play and get out of the realm of where the shepherd kind of goes. And as soon as they were ready to go out and take the children to play and then release their spirits, the door slammed shut, like saying, no, the the children aren't going to be allowed to leave. And this is in the location where I had my very first attack where it felt like something was choking me. And after I left the room where that happened, you know, we had a lot of activity in that room and it was time, you know, to change up groups and let somebody else go in that room while I kind of left and, you know, took a break. And I placed my recorder down. And when I listened to it afterwards, when I had actually left the room after that attack, I actually heard a child's voice and it was clearly a child's voice. And it was almost a relieved sigh, like, okay, hey, you're safe. Like, oh my God, thank God you're safe. You're out of there. You're safe now. And it was, it was like I said, a child spirit. And earlier that night, I had seen a full body apparition of a child. And we do believe that there were children's spirits stuck there, that there's a malicious entity that wasn't allowing them to leave. But um, it was a child that was actually relieved that I was okay. It wasn't something that was trying to hurt me. It was something that was trying to get me away from something that was trying to hurt me. So do I necessarily believe that all children's spirits are children? No, I do believe that they try to manipulate. And like I said, a demon will do whatever they can to tug at your heartstrings to get that invite. Going as far as to posing as a child that wants you just to take them in and love them and care for them, you know, and, you know, invite them in to be like your spirit child. Um, I do. That has happened. But I do believe that sometimes there are children's spirit for whatever reason. They die suddenly and they don't understand that they're dead and they're not taken right away as a lesson for us. And on that note, we're going to hop out for our final break of the night. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio. Andrea Message is our guest. We'll be right back. Greetings and salutations, space travelers, from the Chronicles of the Unknown team. What is Chronicles of the Unknown? I keep hearing about this thing. It's a new paranormal reality TV show based right here in beautiful British Columbia, Canada. Follow our team as we uncover claims of activity on the Caribou Gold Rush Trail. You can also follow us here every third Monday where two members of our team will be available to answer your questions. We'll give you some equipment updates and some of our experiences on the road. Right here on Spaced Out Radio. Hi there, I'm Butch Witkowski, lead investigator with the Four Cop. On the final Monday of every month, you can listen to me and host Dave Scott on Spaced Out Radio's Strange Days. We're going to get to the heart of the matter when it comes to what's happening out there. People are seeing and experiencing things from ET contact to Bigfoot, and I want to hear about it. Your experiences are what we investigators need to help solve these unknown mysteries. So tune in at spacedoutradio.com to the final Monday of every month from Butch Witkowski's Strange Days. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. 
Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit, and expect a miracle. This is your medium, Joanna, from Spaced Out Weekend, Two Mediums and a Large. I would love it if you would come and join us with host James Tyson every other Sunday on Spaced Out Weekend. Together, we will take your calls and your questions live. Our goal is to provide you with a positive outlook on deep questions that you may have. Questions regarding love, relationships, money, or whatever else is on your mind. Come and check us out at spacedoutradio.com. Have you checked out the SOR Spacewire at spacedoutradio.com yet? Every day we post the latest stories regarding the weird, strange, and completely unbelievable. From cryptid and UFO sightings to the conspiracy world, we tackle it all. Hi there, I'm Eric Markham, Space Out Radio's news director for the SOR Space Wire. And if you have a story, I want to hear it. Email me at news at spaceoutradio.com. Patrolling the Pacific Northwest, we are always on the lookout for the strange and unassuming stories that real people are experiencing. Hi, I'm Vincent Zunza from Pacific North Weird. Me and Alexandra Sullivan have teamed to bring to you those odd stories that never seem to make it into the mainstream. Stories so weird that we'll leave you scratching your head wondering, is this real? It's as real as it gets with Pacific North Weird. You can watch our videos right here at spacedoutradio.com. Become more intimate and interactive with Spaced Out Radio. Join our Space Travelers Club with your new membership. For $5 a month, we'll provide you with special access to the website, monthly prize draws from books to psychic readings, along with monthly newsletter, private interviews, and more. Sign up today to be part of Spaced Out Radio's experience. Every month on Spaced Out Radio, we look into the deep and dark reports of cryptids roaming around the world with me, Rob Morphy, from Cryptopia.us. I would love it if you would join me and host Dave Scott as we delve into the most arcane stories and reports regarding creatures of the unknown. My job is to hunt down the details and bring the evidence forward to you. These aren't your regular Bigfoot stories I'm talking about either. You can find out more about crypto history at spacedoutradio.com. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website, including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Strange creatures lurking in the night, the sounds of wood knocking in the forest, odd happenings right out of a fictional world. These are the reports I love. Hi there, this is author Ronald Murphy, and I would love it if you join me and Spaced Out Radio host Dave Scott the second Wednesday of every month on our journey into the unknown land of cryptozoology at spacedoutradio.com. From Mothman to Frogman and everything in between, hey, they don't call me the crypto guru for nothing. Find yourself constantly looking up in the sky, looking for answers? Have you had extraterrestrial contact? Are you an abductee? Looking for answers to your experiences? Hi there, I'm R. Keith Andrews, Spaced Out Radio's resident ET expert. Join me live the first Friday of every month where I take questions from the Spaced Out Radio chat room and help you understand those from the far off world. It's two hours of knowledge every experiencer should listen to. Hope to see you there. Did you know that Spaced Out Radio runs seven days a week? Hi, it's James Tyson from Spaced Out Weekend. Every Saturday and Sunday night, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, you can join me and my guests for some great chatter about what's going on out in the universe or even in that dark part of the basement you really don't want to go back into. Well, let's find the answers to your experiences together. So come on up to Uncle Jimbo's cabin on the weekend. For more information, look us up at spacedoutradio.com. Would you 
like to connect with us on Spaced Out Radio, head to spacedoutradio.com to check out the latest shows, guests, and sponsors. And don't forget to sign up for the Space Travelers Club. You'll find all you need at spacedoutradio.com. Final hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Good to have you with us. Tomorrow night on the show, 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern Time, Euphoria Chronicles, James Borg and his Pleiadian friend, Audrey, will join us. Yes, I have scoped Audrey, and I truly believe Audrey is not of this planet. Tomorrow night, if you want to hear some alien chatter on the mighty SOR, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern Time at spacedoutradio.com. If you want to follow us on Twitter, because you're a social media junkie like I am, do so by going to at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. On Instagram, I can be followed at Dave Scott S O R. You can find our YouTube channel at Spaced Out Radio Show. That's where we store our archives. And our website is spacedoutradio.com. While there, take the time to show, sign up for the SOR Space Travelers Club. It's only 5 bucks a month. And with that, you get access to a private group interviews. You get a private section for your postings on our website and so much more. You can check out our resident guitar god, Ron Bumblefoot Thal, formerly of Guns N' Roses, who takes care of all of Spaced Out Radio's musical needs. You can check out the SOR Space Wire, the weird, the wacky, and the absurd in the news from our news director, Eric Markham, as well. Check out our latest blog section as well. I write every week. This week I've written on how depression and anxiety helps me with this show or maybe it's the other way around this show helps me with my depression and anxiety that's probably more logical tonight we are talking with andrea message she is known as the paranormal ronin because she <laughs> likes that title andrea welcome back i thank you it's always good to have you on the show you know we appreciate you doing this we really do you've been a fantastic guest and we have another 55 minutes with you so i'm excited about it i know our audience is as well we've been talking awesome. a lot about paranormal groups and the and the good the bad you've had to deal with some of the ugly and cleaning up other paranormal groups messes I would love for you to expand on that. What do you mean when you say that you've actually had to go in and clean up the mess left by other paranormal groups? Well, without going into like calling people out or anything like that, because, you know, I don't do that. But um, I, I actually had a client that had come to me. She had gone in and had a local paranormal investigative group. They were just they were new. They were starting to advertise They put up flyers. They said, oh, you know, we deal with ghosts of every sort and, you know, we can find you answers and we can get you the proof that you need. And uh, we believe you. We know you're not crazy. And she's like, well, they're saying everything that I've been, you know, waiting to hear. And, you know, she goes, because everyone keeps telling me I'm crazy. And they're telling me, no, I believe you. I know you're not crazy. And, you know, so they come in and they say, we're going to try to get evidence of, you know, a spirit. So, you know, they kick her out of the house, basically. Um, I'm always the type of person I know a lot of people don't want to be there because sometimes they feel like they're going to be targets of the spirits for bringing help in. But a lot of times if they want to be there during the process, because you know, they're the ones experiencing it, I I have no problem with them being there at the time, but they kicked her out. And when she came back, you know, they said, okay, we're going to go review our evidence. And then she, they'd call back and they'd say, oh, we found this and we found that. And she's like, yeah, but after you left, things got really bad. And she's like, you know, it's been like, you know, it's been keeping me up at night. It seems like it's angry. It's, you know, things are really bad have been happening. My kids are terrified. And they'll say, oh, well, there's really nothing we can do about it. We don't cleanse homes. And uh, she'll be like, well, what did you do? And they're like, oh, well, we did an investigation. And, you know, so then she'll call me in, you know, she and she said, can you please come and help me? And then she'd give me the evidence or that they collected that they gave her and I'd listen through it and I would be hearing them um, basically uh, just, I mean, I mean, kind of like, I'd say going crazy, like making jokes about it or like, you know, 
calling it names, like, you know, like cussing at it, swearing at the spirits, um, you know, kind of like, it, just kind of like, mani- like kind of getting things all riled up. And then abandoning her after they got what they wanted and they got this proof that they think is, you know, going to, they're like, oh, well, you know, this would be really great. Like, you know, can we, they even asked her, can you sign off so that we can use this if we pitch a reality idea to a network or to, you know, a, a production company? And she's like, absolutely not. You know, and so then, you know, I come in and it's bad. You know, I, I come in and I get scratched or I get pushed or she's in tears. She's huddled in a corner. Her children are just terrified. They don't want to sleep there. So, you know, she and her husband and, and the kids have been, whole, you know, kind of shacking up at a hotel because they don't want to be in the house anymore because things have got so stirred up because these people are going in there having fun, trying to get what they can get to get on TV. And I'm the one who has to go in there. And then I'm the one who gets scratched. I'm the one who gets pushed. I'm the one who's now there to help. And they're already ticked off about the last people that came through. And so they're not happy to see me uh, from the get go. And so there's a lot more fight back when it comes to me. And because I am more spiritually in tuned, I consider myself empathic because I can feel the spirits around me. I can sense them more and I seem to have more physical interactions with them than a normal person. So I get hit double hard. You know, I will get the pushes and the scratches and and they will be deep and they will last long and they will hurt. And so I have to go in there and try to clean up what they did. They went in there trying to get something for a reality show they wanted to pitch and, you know, tried to get her to sign off on because they thought they had this really great evidence that would, you know, make for great TV. And that's why they're playing all of this. Oh, yeah, you blanker, blanker. And, you know, I dare you to come and try something to me, you blanker, blanker. And then they just abandon her and they leave and say, well, there's nothing we can do now except like, you know, you just have to accept it. it, it I proved, you know, that there is paranormal in your house just let, you know, deal with it or try to find somebody who can help you if you don't want to. And then they abandon her. And so I, ha- you know, like I said, I'm the one who comes in and cleans it up because I'm the one who studies this. I'm the demonologist. I'm the one who knows priests in the areas who happen to be exorcists and, you know, who can help her. I, I'm the one who knows about different things. And so I have to come in, suffer the abuse from not only the spirit world, but now she's untrusting of groups. She doesn't really know what I'm all about. She doesn't 100% trust me after her experience. So, you know, it it just makes it so much harder for those of us that are legitimately trying to help people because trust is the number one thing we need with our clients. And when you already have a wall of, I don't trust you because of what they did, it makes it very harder for me to do my job. And then top it off with pissed off spirits that are not happy with me right now. So, you know, it, it makes it difficult, but that's what I, it's what I do. It's my vocation. I, I do it anyway, regardless of how hard it is, but I would just like it if these groups would start, you know, doing their job and not making a bigger mess for me. And I can totally see that. And that's something that we talked about ad nauseum, probably in hour number one in regards to, yeah. I mean, this is a classic example of exactly what what is wrong with the paranormal field. Like that group was confident in saying, we did our job. We proved your yep. home your home is haunted. Well, and now, now what? Yeah, yeah. Now, now what? Do you find, though, like if you get to a, a scenario on time or a scene on time, do you find that the spirit maybe wanting to move on maybe oh yes oh oh in fact i just dealt with this in fact i i have this one a client that actually has spirits are coming in and out of her home because i think she has more of a psychic power you know like i think she is psychic and that she can see spirits and the spirits know and so they kind of attach to her but she sees spirits it's like she, we just got her to hang a cross. We had a, a cross that was blessed and we got her to hang it in her house. And there were spirits there at the, she said that she could see them standing at the cross like they were contemplating it. They weren't, they weren't like, you know, mocking it. They weren't trying to be, they weren't trying to scare her. It was like they were praying at the foot of the cross. So when we came in and we did a blessing of the home, and, um, and when I say we, I had a priest with me. At one point, as he was blessing, a chair that was at a table was tucked into a table, jetted out as if someone had pushed back, like backed it out. And I looked at that as a sign that whatever was there finally heard what they needed to get up and be able to leave. 
And like I told her, I said, you know, you have the power to do this too. If you believe in God, if you have the faith, this is what you can tell them. Don't be scared of them. They're not there to hurt you. I said, right now we have this house protected against anything malicious. They can't get back in here as long as you keep your faith. If you if you lose your faith or if you allow fear to run your life, well, you're just inviting them back in. But if you keep your faith and you are very firm and say, look, you don't belong here and I will pray for you. If you need to move on, I will pray for you that you will find that way to move on and go. They will go. And, you know, I'm trying to give her a little more empowerment because I think she's going to have to deal with this probably the rest of her life because she has these psychic abilities. But there are spirits that don't want to be here. They just don't know how to cross over and they need somebody to guide them. It's funny what you do because one of the groups that is involved with Spaced Out Radio, Forest Mood Paranormal out of Washington State, Eric Cooper is the gentleman's name. His group, he calls his a paranormal emergency group for situations mm-hmm. just like you deal with and it'd be interesting to have both of you on the air at the same time because he has paranormal investigators spread literally worldwide whether it's psychic yeah. mediums whether it's remote viewers whether it's paranormal groups whoever to help deal with situations do you find that your client list because of these types of actions is actually growing as the paranormal community has grown so much it larger than it was? It's growing. It's definitely growing. And I think a lot of it has to do not just with the paranormal groups themselves. And um, I think... A lot of it, like, you know, has to do with the TV shows. Again, people who are once afraid to admit that they were having problems are saying now it's mainstream and now it's kind of cool to have paranormal issues so they don't feel as afraid to reach out and actually seek the help that they wanted before, you know, before they were just like, I'm going to get laughed at. People are going to mock me. My family's going to ostracize me. My church is going to, you know, like they're going to turn away from me. I can't do this, you know. But then they find out that there are groups out there that are willing to help them and that they're willing to hold confidentiality. They're not going to go blasting your name and your location all over. Like, you know, even when I wrote my book, I got express permission from the family of that one little girl I was telling you about, about the rocking chair and how she was having this, what they thought was an imaginary friend at first. I got their permission to actually put them in the book, but I still didn't use their name or their location. I changed the names and, you know, where they lived to protect their identity. So they know that they have that confidentiality where they can come forward and get the help. I also think that because the occult is a lot easier accessible online and on smart smartphones and they even have games now like occult games like you know where you can play the Ouija board on your phone or play tarot cards on your phone it makes the occult so more accessible that I think that's another reason we're seeing an influx of um what we could call demonic activity or paranormal activity. A lot of people also say that the way the world is changing is causing an influx. The way our world is, you know, we're moving away from being united as people, like even in America, we are so divided as a nation, you know, and and that's causing so much, like it's opening almost like a spiritual rift. And that's what's kind of bringing, so I think there's a lot of variables for why the world is getting to be a little bit more active than it was before. Uh, But I think the biggest thing is that people are just realizing that there are people out there who can help and are coming forward to tell their stories now where before they were kind of trapped in silence out of fear from being ridiculed. Um, But there, yeah, I do definitely think there's been a greater influx probably within the last 10 years in the paranormal field. Because when I first started almost 13 years ago now, gosh, I'm coming up to the lucky 13, um, I was nowhere near as busy as I am now. I mean, you know, and I, I mean, it's it's just, it's been crazy. I call this a cursed year. For some reason, it just seems there are more issues this year. I mean, so huge celebrity passings, you know, really big names like David Bowie and Alan Rickman. And, you know, and then you have um, people are having like bad, it just seems like everyone's having bad luck. And it seems like this year has been a great year for paranormal activity. So I don't know if it has something to do with something going on in the world, but um, definitely I think there's a lot of reasons. One is the accessibility to information on the paranormal and people are more open 
two is the accessibility to the occult via the internet and smartphones, and that can cause trouble. And, you know, three, you know, just, I think a change in the world that's happening is, you know, causing a lot of uh, paranormal issues to happen. Before we go any further, Bill Cardwell finally showed up to Space Out Radio tonight. He is our resident space traveler, number one in our books, number one in our hearts. He has said the password for tonight's space travelers. It is Cockademon. Cockademon is the password. I probably didn't pronounce that right, but Cockademon is... C O C K D E M O N. C A C O D E M O N. Oh, I thought it was okay. I spelled that completely not, wrong. Not cock o demon, cacodemon, cacodemon. Okay. I guess yes. So that better be worth a big mention on Bill's part. The pressure's on him now to pull on through. I have a couple questions from the Space Out Radio chat room on Spreaker for you. This one comes from Eric. He is asking, "How do you pacify angry spirits? How do you calm them down?" I honestly don't pacify them. If you have an angry spirit that is doing malicious things to a person or in a business or a location, my goal is to get rid of them. My goal is to put them to where they belong. If they're demonic, you you send them back to the fiery place down below. If they're just malicious, like I say, people are in death the way they are in life if they remain as spirits. If you were a jerk in death or a jerk in life, you're going to be a jerk in death. So you could be a malicious, but you know, still human entity. Um, and so then I do still try to send them to where they belong. I send them to their, whether it's their judgment or whether it's their place of purgatory, if you believe in purgatory as I do, or whether, you know, it's heaven or hell, depending on what they did in their life. Uh, that's not for me to judge. That's, you know, between them and God, if they believed in God and, but I need to send them there. I need that needs to be where they have to go. If they're angry, if they, they need to see the light, they need to understand their situation. They need to deal with it, you know, like suck it up buttercup and move on your way. You don't want to leave an angry spirit. You don't want to just pacify them and, oh, okay, now they're happy and, you know, everything's fine and you can live in harmony with them. And it's better to, my philosophy is this world is not always fun. You know, I mean, this, I, I, I've said myself many times, like if, if, you know, God forbid, like hopefully when I'm 110 years old and I finally am ready to pass, I don't want to stay here as a spirit. You know, I don't want to have to live this whole life again. So, you know, can you imagine like if you were born in the 1700s and you're a ghost and the world is changing around you, but you're still the same and the things that you think are still the same, but nothing is the same around you. That has to be a very scary experience. So whether they are a benevolent entity or a malevolent entity, you want to guide them to where they belong because being stuck here is not a great alternative for them, no matter what it is. And it's not a great alternative for the people who encounter them because even if they're benevolent and they don't mean harm, they can still scare a person and they can still, you know, mess with the person's psyche and make them feel, you know, like actually traumatize them. I know somebody who's had an experience absolutely traumatized for life, suffers from depression, suffers from anxiety now ever since this one interaction. So it's best to try to kind of guide them on their way out. But if there's a malicious entity or an angry entity, I don't pacify them. I just lay down the law. I say, this is your situation. Situation, and this is what's going to have to happen. Dawn is asking in the Space Out Radio chat room on Spreaker, how do you convince them to go to hell? <laughs> yeah, you know, well, you know, again, I, that's not, we don't convince them to go to hell. Um, what happens, like, if you're dealing with the demonic, they know where they're going to have to go anyway. You don't have to convince them that that's just the only place they can go. Um, and that, again, I don't do myself personally. I bring in a priest who has the right. It's a Roman ritual. And uh, me personally, I prefer when we deal with the pre-Vatican II Roman ritual and we're dealing with the Latin, I find it a lot more effective. But that's the priest's area. Um, and they don't, they don't convince them to go. They command them in the name of God to go. And in, in my religion, at least, as a Catholic, I believe that God commands all things. And that even the demons here on earth and that are manipulating and causing harm, 
that, you know, God allows that to some extent for many reasons. And there's many reasons God would allow that, but he never lets a demon do any further than he will allow. And, um, so if you command in the name of God that they have to go, that they don't have a choice and you wear them down, you break them down and eventually they don't have a choice but to obey the command of God. It's not what we're telling them to do. We're not commanding them to go. We're not telling them to go. We're not convincing them to go. We're saying, hey, you know, God is telling you, you can't stay here. And, you know, we're telling them, we're feeding them these prayers. We're feeding them God's word. We're angering them. We're wearing them down until they say that they'll just leave. Um, but it's God, not us. It has nothing to do with us. We're just conveying God's message. And again, it's not convincing. It's commanding by God's name. Like God is commanding them to go. And we're just being God's voice saying, God's telling you to go. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about it. There is no convincing like, well, you know, hell's such a nice place. You know, it's warm. <laughs> I mean, when winters here suck. And, you know, you don't have to worry about like 10 feet of snow. It's not that. It's God says you got to go and you got to get going. And, and there is no convincing. It's Just a command. But it comes from God. Just snap yeah. in them fingers. Get it out. Get out. Exactly. <laughs> yep. It's not, you're not convincing them. You're telling them, but it's not you. It's coming from God, at least, you know, the way I do it and the way I work with the priests who do it. Follow up question from Don. But if it's not a, de- a demon, but just an evil spirited person, how do you make it happen? Well, if it's a malicious entity, you, basically they're still people. You can still reason with them. Um, and they could be angry for many reasons, and they could just be jerks for many reasons. Um, but again, all spirits, like if you believe in religion, all spirits bend to God's will. All spirits have to obey God's command. In the Bible, it says that, you know, every knee shall bend before the cross, whether in heaven, on earth, or below the earth. So, um, you know, when you're telling them in God's name, they have to move on to their just judgment. You know, they, they usually will, whether they're malicious or not. But a lot of times you can reason with them. You can say, look, you know, okay, it's scary to move over to the other side. It is. I get it. And you're angry because this is your situation. But you know what? Anything over there has got to be better than what's over here. And just because you think you weren't good enough to make it to heaven doesn't mean that you won't because God is merciful. So go and see, you know, reason. You can reason with them, but if they still refuse to go, then it's the same thing as trying to expel a demonic influence by coming in and saying, in the name of God, you don't have a choice. Eric is wondering, what what happens if you have a spirit that on this side was non-Christian? What leverage does a Christian have on those? Well, you see, when we actually believe that they when they've crossed over they have a better understanding a lot of times than a lot of us have. It's it's almost like a psychic awakening. And we believe at least, again, this is my personal belief. This is, you know, the belief that I've had from, you know, years of research and then working with other religions. And But I believe that they do have a spiritual awakening, awakening and they do, you know, because I believe in God, I believe God exists. And I think that once they cross over and realize their situation, they realize God exists too, and um, that they will fall, because like I said, God commands all things, and you know they will eventually, if they have that spiritual awakening, they will listen to God's command. Uh, and sometimes it's not even that far where you have to go that far. Like I said, with human spirits, they were just like us in life, and sometimes reasoning with them, like in the book Ghost in the Coal Cellar, when I was talking about that little girl— they didn't have to have the priest come in and, you know, and bring God into it and say, like, you know, God commands you to leave, you know, but the, the powers of God compels you, you know, it's like, no, all they said was like, you know what, thanks for being here and looking after my children. And I understand that you're here because you miss your wife so desperately, but you realize your wife's not here anymore. Your wife has crossed over. Go be with her. It's okay. We'll be fine. And we'll miss you and we'll pray for you and we'll think about you often because my daughter's going to, you know, my daughter loved you. She looked at you as a friend, but it's okay to go be with your wife. And then there was a sign that he left and there was no more paranormal activity after that. So sometimes it's just a matter of talking to them like they were people because they they were people. And to try to be understanding, but to to let them know, look, we don't want to be afraid anymore, and we don't want you to be stuck here anymore. Let's just 
agree to go separate ways. And a lot of times the spirit, they might not cross over, but they will sometimes leave that actual location if they're asked to. Spear has a question in the Spaced Out Radio chat room on Spreaker and is asking, have you ever seen any cases where the spirits and the living ended up just kind of getting along? I'll answer that quickly here. (laughs) August of last year, I actually came face to face with the spirit on my property because I broadcast out of my house. It was during the Perseid meteor shower. (laughs) <laughs> and I had a, a young lady named uh, Angela Dixon on. We were talking about psychic dreaming that night. And I go outside during one of the breaks to check on the uh, on the meteor shower, see if I could see any, because I'm a real geek when it comes to that. And I have this tree close to my house in the backyard, and something caught my attention. And I turned my head and looked, and I saw a full-bodied apparition of a man wearing a white T-shirt, kind of the light blue, blue jeans, that were almost white, but they weren't white. And I watched him disappear right in front of me. Anyways, next thing I know, I I come back on the air and I tell Angela what I saw. And the gentleman, whose name is Richard, but he goes by Rick, actually starts channeling through her at the same time. So we end up having this conversation with this guy. And long story short... He was looking for, she says to me, was there an addition put on your house? And I said, yes. She goes, well, how long ago? I said, I have no idea. The house is 40 years old. Long story short, where the addition was, that's where his workbench was, where he used to work with wood. And he basically said through her that he loves this property and doesn't want to leave and actually asked me politely if, if I minded if he stayed. And I said, no, stay all you want. I said, but I need a favor. And he's like, what's that through Angela? And I said, I have small, a small child and I have a teenager and I really don't want any big animals coming into the property. I said, the deer, I don't mind, but please be wary of, of the bears and the, and the cougars that are around this area. And if it wasn't a few weeks later, my wife is like, yelling at me from upstairs, Dave, there's a bear in the yard, bear in the yard. And she said, and I never saw the bear, but she said the minute the bear entered our yard, it took off and couldn't get out of our yard fast enough and and ju- literally like climbed over the fence as quickly as possible to get out of our yard. So I've always yeah. wondered if that was him in doing that. So yes, I, I, doubt it. I do believe that you can have a peaceful relationship with spirit in your house or in yeah. my case on the property. How about you? I, you know what? I, I do believe you can. I personally, like I said, I hate the, uh, the thought of like somebody from like the 1700s and all of a sudden they see cars and, and airplanes flying through the sky and things just going on around, they're staying the same. And I, th- I find that kind of sad. And if they want to move on and they want help to move on, that that's my ultimate goal is to help the people and the spirits as well. But I have heard where people are saying, I don't want you to touch the spirit. I just want, they're not hurting. And, you know, and they lived in perfect harmony with the spirit afterwards. And, and I always said, you know, like somebody actually posted a meme on Facebook. I can't remember which one posted it. And I said, this is, this could be possibly true. Cause I said, you know, I've always been, you know, I'm single. I've had bad luck with guys. I said, and the meme said, maybe there's a spirit that a ghost is in love with me and is using all the guys away, you know? It's so I mean, who knows? Maybe, maybe that's why I have such bad luck with men because I got a spirit that's in love with me and living in harmony with me and I don't even know it. And he's just keeping all the good guys away from me because, you know, wants me to himself. <laughs> but no, I think know. it is possible. I, I think you never know. And I think it's possible, but I think living in harmony can be possible. But I mean, I just can't believe that a spirit would just want to stay forever in this ever-changing world that's you know sometimes worse sometimes better you know and it's just unpredictable you would think that eventually they will want to cross over one day they might not be ready right now but you know in the future they might be bill cardwell has a question in the sor space travelers club he is asking what's worse in your opinion a demon or a really pissed off evil spirit that just won't go away God, is there, can you really say worse? Um, I will go ahead and I will say demon 
because as pissed off as a human entity can be and as much havoc as they can wreak in your life and as much as they can try to manipulate you. And sometimes they actually are manipulated by demons, like demons will actually use their negative energy to cause further harm. But a demon can physically harm you in many ways. In fact, there, many demonologists will, or and even uh, exorcists will tell you, if you read a lot of books that are written by exorcists, like Father Amroff and, and other, you know, Father Fertea and th- you know, really do- uh, prominent exorcists, many exorcists have died because of dealing with demons and have actually passed because of the fight and the battle with demons. Uh, demons are no joke. They're not something that you want to mess with. It's like I said, this is not a vocation for everybody. I mean, when people's, when I said I've decided I'm going to become a demonologist because I think that's what my calling is. I even had people look at me like, are you nuts? Are you crazy? Do you realize how bad things can get? And I said that, I think that's the point. I do. A lot of people don't, but I do. So I still go with demons. You never, ever turn your back on a demon. You never, ever trust a demon. You know, a malicious entity, like I said, has certain restrictions against it because it doesn't have the power unless it's being manipulated by a demon. But at that point, once again, the demon is what's the most dangerous thing because that's the thing manipulating the human entity. So I definitely would go with demons. <clears throat> Question from Steve in all the way in Australia, who's listening to us. Oh, where, where it's tomorrow? Okay. Where it's tomorrow? I think it's around six o'clock tomorrow. He can confirm that. Kangaroos. Exactly. He is asking: Has there <laughs> ever been a case of mass hauntings in a new housing estates where homes have been built on burial grounds that people weren't told about? If so, how did they deal with that? Do you mind if I answer this one first? No, you know what? Go ahead. Okay. In British Columbia here, there was a famous serial murderer named Willie Picton. And Willie Picton in the city of Coquitlam had a pig farm. And they believe he murdered anywhere between 35 and 70 women, most of them downtown east side Vancouver prostitutes and and drug addicts. So he would lure them to the pig farm. And then what he would do is the most disgusting thing. I'm going to mention this, so if you have soft ears, please plug your ears or turn your volume down. There's your warning. But what he would do is after he murdered his victims, he would decapitate them. And a lot of the ladies, he he would actually put through a, a wood chipper to get rid of the evidence. And... As property start value started growing in his area, the family started selling their property and sectioning it off and cutting down the size of their farm. There is now subdivisions. They've torn down the house. They've torn down the farm. There's subdivisions all over that place. I have not heard if there is paranormal activity there i'm not even sure it's canadian law that they have to disclose it but i do know this that in that investigation police when the farm was finally found out and he was arrested police were positive that many of the dna samples bone samples or clothing samples were actually buried in the ground or spread around the ground where there was subdivisions holding or being built at that time. So some of the ladies and their DNA or anything from them, even though they know they're there, they can't even check up on them. It is a sad situation for sure. But it, yes, it does happen. Yeah, Definitely. Um, and then going back to council and they would find it and they, they rebury it with the proper respect um, at a different location. But that whole island, they always keep finding different bodies that were buried there. And that island is one of the most haunted islands in America. I mean, you can go from the east end to the west end and every building, every place has a story of a haunting that's occurring there. Um, it, so it is one of the most haunted locations, and it, it was a mass burial ground before it started to build up and become an actual community where people live and shop and visit. And So it is definitely possible. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. It is something that is really... 
it's not a good situation when you start getting into things like that. But it's unfortunate yeah, yeah. that that you know a lot of the public, like for instance, I would never live there. Like on the pig farm, yeah. I mean, that's what everybody calls it. Oh, you live where the pig farm used to be. You know, I I couldn't live there. It just to yeah. me, to me, I would know I would end up with the most haunted block or ha- ha- haunted <laughs> house on the block. Question yeah. from J A in the S O R Space Travelers: Isn't it clear that people in the afterlife condition spend an awful lot of energy trying to show and tell us religious teachings and religions are wrong? Uh, can you say that again? Okay. Isn't it clear that people in the afterlife condition, or in the afterlife condition, so they're dead. Let's talk English here. They're dead. Yeah. Spend yeah. A, an awful lot of energy trying to show and tell us that religious teachings and religions are wrong. I have never encountered that before in over a decade. In fact, religion is almost never brought up. Unless, you know, I bring it up in order to help a spirit move on. I mean, I've had spirits tell me their name. I've had spirits, you know, tell me when they died or how they died. I've had spirits answer questions that I've posed forth. I actually had a spirit that when I was praying, you have the spirit actually saying, amen, amen, at the end of the prayers, um, which is a very religious, it means I believe, amen means I believe. And so when you say a prayer and you finish it with amen, you're saying I believe. And there's a spirit that says amen. I have spirits that actually, like, you know, again, when you're talking about the demonic, when you start talking to a to bring the body and just to do one thing, and then they have to rest and rebuild that energy. They can't sit there and have like a conversation like I'm having where they can just, like I said, have diarrhea of the mouth and go on for hours and do a dissertation about, you know, religious theology. Um, so, no, I have never encountered that. Let's talk about demons. We got about 15, 16 minutes left with you, Andrea, here on the show. Okay. The popularization of demons and demonology has really taken off in the last 18 months where it seems like almost everybody and their dog is a demonologist now. And we can obviously thank television for that. How many demons have you truly ran into? Me personally, when it comes to actual physical provable demons... I would say in the course of 12 years and hundreds of cases, you know, we're talking at least over 400 or so cases, I can maybe say uh, three or four percent that I am confident were demonic. Um, And that doesn't mean that there aren't more out there. That's just what I've personally covered. Um, I've gone to places where like people are so afraid of the paranormal that they're convinced it's demonic. I mean, I know that there are some people that say all ghosts are demons. They don't believe in human spirits whatsoever. They believe that it's either you're either a miraculous presence of an angel or the demonic presence. There is no in between. So they automatically believe everything is demonic. And I'll go in there and I'll find out, no, it's not demonic. It is an intelligent haunting. This is not a spirit that's trying to hurt you. This is a spirit that, you know, we can cross over. They want to leave. They're not trying to stay here. They want to go, you know. So, you know, they'll think it's demonic. They'll believe it's demonic because they don't believe in other spirits. But it's not necessarily demonic once I get in there. And just a safe episode, like, you know, some, you know, like all of a sudden you're going to get this blank stare on your face. You know, it doesn't happen like that. Um, it is more common lately. Again, there is more access to the occult thanks to the Internet and thanks to smartphones and, you know, just people in general, you know, looking, like you said, on TV and it, it's being more popularized. And so there is a lot more happening nowadays. People are accepting demons and to their lives or asking demons to come in or inviting them in some way, whether accidentally or intentionally. Um, so it is on the rise, but it still doesn't mean that it is a very large number of what we do. Even as a demonologist, it's still not the largest number of what I do. I still deal a lot with residuals and with um, intelligent hauntings on the most part. <clears throat> Do you think that because of the population or the popularity, pardon me, of demonology now, that 
it's just the fad of the paranormal now. It's just something that everybody feels they have to do because, let's face it, the paranormal is a big copycat when it comes to it is. doing it is. whatever else everyone else is. Oh, definitely. Everybody with a sage stick thinks they're a demonologist. You know, if they know how to, like, burn sage, they immediately say, I'm a demonologist, when it, it's a lot more involved in that. When, you know, I decided that I was going to become a demonologist, I've studied theology. And like I said, I'm Catholic, but I've gone outside Catholicism. I've studied other Christian religions. I've studied outside of Christianity about their beliefs and their practices. And, you know, and I've worked with priests who are actual exorcists. You know, this was, this is to me a vocation. This is almost like somebody gets called to be a priest or they get called to be a nun and there's just no way I could be a nun. I, I couldn't live that kind of a life. You know, I've, I've got the mouth of a sailor and no filter. So, you know, I, I felt like this is my vocation. This is what I was called to do. And I take it very, very seriously. But like I said, lately, everybody with a sage stick thinks that they're a demonologist. And again, you have the issue where they come in and they sage everything. And, you know, they it's like a Band-Aid where it stops the bleeding for a time. But then sometimes if you pull that Band-Aid off and you rip off the scab underneath, it starts to bleed again. And that's when I have to come in and, you know, do what I have to do to try to fix the situation. But, yeah, it is becoming very fatty. I mean, the the idea of being a demonologist, they, they hold it like it's some kind of like a doctorate title. You know, they think it's like, you know, like one of the most important titles in the paranormal field when it's not. There is no title in the paranormal field that is any more important than the next. A paranormal researcher is just as important as a paranormal investigator, is just as important as a demonologist, is just as important as an exorcist. We all have a role to play and none of us are more important. And when you bring pride into it and you try to say, look how great I am, well, then you're actually feeding the malicious entities because they feed off of our sins and pride is one of the seven deadly sins. So, you know, you can't go into it thinking, well, I'm a demonologist. I got a sage stick. Look how great I am. I'm going to, I can help people. It's, you know, it's a vocation. It's a calling. It's something that you have to study. It's something that you have to research and prepare for and take very seriously and not put yourself like, you know, you feel you put yourself way down. Like you don't think like you're doing anything special or anything important, you know, that this is just, you know, a job that you're doing to help others. It's, it's a vocation, not a celebrity status. Where are these so-called demonologists getting their training from? Because as far as I had always known, you needed to be a Catholic priest in order to do exorcisms and take part in getting rid of these demons. And now, with with the demonologists popping up faster than, you know, whatever the analogy you want to make. I mean, where are they getting their training or are they just self-titling themselves? Many demonologists are self-titling themselves. Um, again, it's, they say, like, they go into a place that they say have, like, and like I said, a lot of times they'll go in and they'll say it's to, like, they'll see an orb that is dust because, you know, the reflection of the light when it hits a particle of dust or it hits a particle of moisture or dander, it can cause that glowing ball look when the um, flash of your camera actually captures it. But they'll say, oh, look, there's a demonic face in there. And then they'll go with a sage stick, even though there's not a demon in there, they'll go with a sage stick and then say, look, see, there's no demonic activity. I took care of it. 